All right, so calling to order Historic Landmarks Commission, July 8th, 2020. So we'll start with a roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Heidi Rydell. I will begin the roll call. Chair Grumbine. Here. Vice Chair House. Here. Commissioner Drury. Here. Commissioner Edmonds. Here. Commissioner Lenvik. Here. Commissioner Mahan. Here. Commissioner Uli. Here. Commissioner Vena. Here. Here. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, so now we will um, open public comment. Any member of the public may address the commission for up to two minutes on any subject within its jurisdiction that is not scheduled on this agenda for public discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would ask that um, all of the uh, commissioners, if you would, those of you who have a webcam, if you could please turn them on. Uh, and this is just to let the public know that if you wish to speak on a particular uh, or on um, a non-agendized item, please raise your hand. I see Pat Daly. Oh, um, I just saw Pat's hand go down, but Pat Saley, if you could um, unmute yourself, you have um, using your GoToWebinar control panel, you'll click on the microphone icon and you'll have two minutes to speak. Pat Saley, it looks like you just turned it on. So uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, I'd like to address the topic of story polls. Story polls have been around for a long time, although they don't seem to be used much in the city. That's unfortunate as they're very effective at helping people see how a proposed project would fit into the fabric of the community. I found an informative council report from February of 2017 that spoke to story poll requirements, particularly for AUD projects. And that report said that there are four reasons that visual aids such as story polls should be used. First, to determine project consistency with policies. Second, to make environmental findings or approve discretionary land use entitlements. Third, to evaluate size, bulk, and scale. Fourth, to evaluate project neighborhood compatibility and any impacts to public scenic views. And that resolution says that planning commission, or excuse me, AUD projects that require planning commission review shall have story polls with limited exceptions. And you had a project on your agenda last, uh, two weeks ago, 410 State, that raised the issue of story polls. I wanted to speak, but your meeting ran very late and there were technical issues. But I think that because that project exceeds the height limit by seven feet, there are small scale buildings surrounding it and several historic buildings nearby, that project cried out for story poles. And I would implore you to require them for these large projects. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next I have Mary Louise Days. Mary Louise, I've just unmuted you. If you can please unmute yourself using the microphone icon on your GoToWebinar control panel. Mary Louise Days, it's the, um, if you look at your control panel, you'll find, thank you, Timmy. Um, right here, we have an arrow yeah. pointed up. There you go, okay. okay. It looks like your audio is on. Whenever you're ready, you have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to uh, inform those of you who may not have seen the new spring 2020 issue of La Campana, the publication of the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. It has a photo of the uh, old 19th century courthouse on the cover. And uh, the feature article inside is called the Santa Barbara County Courthouse, a community and global icon. And it's um, one of its authors is Robert L. Uli, who is one of your members. It's a very thorough, interesting, article I know because I had to edit it 
and copy read it. And uh, it's got many uh, very good illustrations and plans. And uh, if you haven't seen the copy yet, I'd urge you just to read it. It's uh, really, really worth your while. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And then we have Mr. Richard Clausen next. And I would just ask for those who have just recently joined us, this is general public comment. And if you wish to speak, uh, you can raise your hand using the hand icon on your GoToWebinar control panel. And I'll call on you and you would have two minutes to speak. So Mr. Clausen, I've just unmuted you. Um, if you could please unmute yourself using the microphone icon. There you go. And whenever you're ready, thank you. Uh, thank you. In City Council Resolution number 17-006 on story poll use for AUDs, it is clear the council intended and expected story polls to be useful to members of the public and to be a typical part of the discovery process for certain projects. Story polls are not erected solely for the visual consideration of experienced architects on HLC who may dismiss them as worthless. They could be very instructive in several ways to untrained public. If the commission once educated public interest in what you do, instead of being flooded with hundreds of passionate but uninformed comments, you should use every opportunity to encourage and engage that interest, if only by the erection of mysterious story polls that might pique public curiosity. This was an opportunity to display one of the many design considerations that go into approving construction, particularly in EPV. That is, how does its bulk and height fit with its surroundings? This is one of those things with the aid of story polls intended by city council that the public can sense innately without your experience. Every time you exempt story polls from a project, you risk missing an opportunity for your work to come out of the shadows and be better understood by the public. Part of the reason commissioners were flooded with communications about St. Paul's AME Church and other structures of possible historic black importance um, was was that almost no one outside of officialdom knows what HLC does and how important your role is. Half of the letters implied HLC could landmark buildings on nothing more than a large public demand and with the wave of a wand. Accepting the project at 410 State Street from story polls was a self-inflicted wound. It's one thing to be pushed aside by the city council on the grounds that we need the housing, but why diminish your own role? Story polls are an opportunity for a developer to fund a tiny bit of public education. The issue doesn't arise on most projects, only the large scale expensive prime situated ones, including AUD projects. The requirement needs to be reinstated on this project. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Mr. Chair, that is the last person that I have see that I see who has raised their hand. Um, I'll just ask maybe one last time if you wish to speak on a general item, please raise your hand now. And uh, and I'll ask Pilar if we received any written comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kokinda. Um, we received one written correspondence, I believe, and that was uh, from Mr. Richard Clausen, uh, who was also speaking. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so we acknowledge that as well. Um, and I think now we'll close public comment and on to the approval of minutes of the Historic Landmarks Commission meeting June 24th, 2020. Uh, Commissioner Grumbine. Yes, Ms. Ostringer. Thank you, sir. I know uh, we did receive some public comment and there was a reference in the public comment regarding story polls with regards to a motion to renew. Um, and I just wanted to explain that that's not something that we can do. Um, it procedurally it would have had to come in to us in a different manner. You would have had to have made a motion to rescind first um, and then uh, we could have possibly agendized it for a later meeting, but because there was no motion to rescind um, made at your meeting or um, within two business days afterwards, uh, a motion to renew is not possible. So I wasn't sure if any of you would have those questions. And also um, the, the reason generally behind that is Robert's rules uh, apply nationally and um, in particular in the state of California, we have the Brown Act. So we would have to put something on the agenda in order to reconsider a motion. So we couldn't hear that at that time. So I wanted to explain that both for the public's benefit and for your benefit. 
So thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. So with that, so we have the uh, approval of the, min uh, the minutes. Is there a motion? Uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Drury. I'll make, a, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Okay. Second by Uli. Under discussion, edit. Mr. Mahan, did you have an edit? Mr. Chair, I do have uh, several. Um, on page five uh, in, uh, in the motion, item seven, the wrought iron balconies are improved, but the top and bottom railing needs more refinement. I think, I think the word refinement isn't um, clear enough. I think maybe we should say it should be more traditional. And, and uh, I remember that uh, Commissioner Lindvik suggested a certain way that they would be more traditional. And I think you talked about the railings at the top of the uh, courthouse tower being something else, but in both cases, they were more traditional. I think that'd be a better word to use. Okay. Then in, I, that makes sense. Yeah. Then in the next item uh, eight, item number eight, the commission cautions that the encaustic tile may not be appropriate, but looks forward to seeing it in person. I think it would be better off to say look that we look forward to seeing the actual samples. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then we think not, once I have it, not once it's built, right? You don't didn't want to wait till it's built and then see it. Cool. I had one more. Okay. Here. Yep. I guess. I guess that's it for me. If it if it isn't, I'll come back to you. Oh no, there's one other okay. one here. Um, right. On I on page seven, uh, item three. No, let's see. It's item four. The, Gar the Guterres Street and Paseo elevations could be activated a bit more. I think the word is articulated a bit more rather than activated. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, Does any chair? other... Yep. Mr. Yes. So, uh, on that same, the State Street to Gutierrez item, is it number four, I think? Um, the, um, this is a point of order and I need some um, advice. I um, have regretted my, my, um, um, my voting the way I did. I, w I would have voted with uh, Commissioner House. I just didn't think it through. And I, is it important? Is it possible to change the vote or is just the cat out of the bag? I think it's no changes. No change. Mr. Chair, and then yes. to Commissioner Jury, that would not be possible at this time. Yeah. So that's just set in stone. Okay. Well, I'm yes. I'm you know, I'm taking up your time. Thank you. All right. No problem, Commissioner Jury. Other um other uh, edits? Okay. Um, well, with that, uh, so with uh, the, the maker of the motion and the seconder both okay with those edits, Mr. Mahan. Or sorry, never not mind. Commissioner Mahan. It was Commissioner never, never mind. Drury. Never mind. Drury and Uli. Okay. I'm fine with those. I'm fine with those. Yes. The seconder is is also fine. Okay. Great. All right. So with that. Um, motion to approve the minutes, All, uh, roll call and vote. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Heidi Rydell. I will take the roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Uli. I'm fiddling with my buttons, so sorry for the delay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Drury. Yes. Commissioner Lenvik. Yes. Commissioner Vena. We can't hear you, Commissioner Vena. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner House. Um, aye. Commissioner Mahan. 
Yes. Commissioner Edmonds. Yes. Chair Grumbine. Aye. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. And now we are on to item C, approval of the consent calendar, July 8th, 2020. Ms. Plummer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item A, uh, 700 to 800 to Paula Street received project design approval and final approval. And item B, 32 East Junipero Street received project design and approval and final approval. Item A was reviewed by uh, Commissioner Mahan and Commissioner Vena, and item B was reviewed by Commissioner Mahan, Vena, and Chair Grumbine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Calendar. Sorry, was that a motion to approve the consent calendar, Commissioner Early? Correct. I'll okay. second that. Uh, Commissioner Lundvik second. All right, under discussion. Any discussion? All right, all those uh, roll call, I guess. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Heidi Rydell. I'll begin the roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Drury? Yes. Commissioner Lundvik? Yes. Commissioner Vena? Yes. Vice Chair House? Aye. Commissioner Mahan? Yes. Commissioner Edmonds? Um, I'm going to say yes to item um, A, and I'm going to recuse myself from B. Uh, Commissioner Uli? Yes. Chair Grumbine? Aye. Thank you so much. All right, great. Okay, so then we are on to item uh, D, announcements, requests by applicants for continuances and withdrawals, future agenda items and appeals. All right, Ms. Plummer or anyone on staff have announcements? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have any announcements at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair? Commissioner Drury? I have to leave by 10 after six today. All right. Thank you. We'll, we'll keep the charge going. Okay. Um, uh, any other announcements? Commissioner uh, Lenbeck, did you want to say anything about the um, objective design standards? Do, do we, didn't we have that within, between the two? Chelsea meetings, I want to say? It, it was actually uh, three weeks ago, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, I can speak to it. Um, okay. Yeah, if you if you wouldn't mind, give a little brief. Yeah, I, w I will. Um, Commissioner Grumbine and I were there, and we uh, had a discussion among ourselves that uh, probably upset staff more than it did us. <laughs> uh, the changes. Um, that have been made in the last several meetings uh, are are now complete, and I think the staff is in the process of um, reformatting the the document, uh, making it more usable, and uh, they intend, I believe, to take it to the next step, which would be, um, I guess, ordinance committee. Uh, I'm not sure what that probably is, ordinance committee. Um, but it is, uh, as you are all aware, it is a, uh, uh, a design standard that uh, will be used by applicants who come in with uh, uh, mixed use or multifamily housing and want to have their project reviewed under state law, um, AB 35 and AB 330, or SB 330. Um, and uh, it's basically a, um, I would say, a landmarks review light document, which would be applied to any place uh, within the city in which uh, these housing projects would be proposed. So um, it's it's being uh, you know finalized right now and. Uh, I don't expect there'll be any more meetings of our committee. The next time we'll see it will be at uh, probably an ordinance committee meeting. Thank you. Unless you have something to add to that, uh, sure, run by. 
Um, I think that's a pretty good summary, although I'm not sure exactly the, the, the process, whether we'll see it all again or at, at exactly what time, but it was basically incorporating a lot of those, the comments that have been, um, that everyone has contributed and kind of working that into um, a, I would say a near final, you know, getting, getting there it's a draft. So, um, Commissioner House. Yes, I just wanted to say I would uh, hope that it would come back to HLC before it goes to Ordinance Committee because I think the Ordinance Committee needs to know if the full HLC has reviewed the final draft and supports it. And I don't, I don't know if staff has an update for us, and I, and I can't remember the exact timeline of everything. Um, so we can, we can get an update if we don't have one this week. Or we can get one uh, uh, either sent out to us or um, uh, on, in, in two weeks, get we get a report back what the game plan is. So okay, yeah, I, I, that dies for the next meeting. Um, is there a date set for the ordinance committee meeting? Pilar? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, and then to Vice Chair House, um, I'll need to confirm with Rosie Dicey and the team that's working on the objective design standards. Um, I can probably send uh, the commission an email within a couple days on that. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Drury. Yeah, I would concur with Commissioner Howes. I, I'd like to see that draft form before we approve it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Uh, I don't, I don't believe it is a document which we will approve. And if I recall, it wasn't the intention of the staff to bring it back for more input. Am I wrong? So uh, along those lines, let's confirm that exactly what the time frame is. I think you're right in that we don't, it's not for HLC to approve, it's citywide and it's state-based, um, but it is for HLC input. And I don't know if that input's gonna happen for the next wave of before or after it goes to ordinance or what. So I agree, I, I don't know. I think we just need to find the timeline, but I think you're right in that it's not our decision to approve or not. So, Ms. Plummer? Yeah, Mr. Chair and to Commissioner Lundvik, when I reach out to Rosie Dicey and the team that's working on that, I'll, I'll provide that information to the commission, exactly what our purview is over it. Thank you. All right, sounds good. And we'll, we'll keep moving on here. Um, subcommittee meetings, uh, uh, Commissioner Uli, did you wanna touch, oh wait, do we already touch base? And now I'm, everything's been such a blur the last couple of weeks. Um, the the uh, designation subcommittee. Did we already report on that? Was that yeah? That was the morning of the um, of two weeks ago. So yes. okay, I guess we're we don't need to report on that. Um, any other subcommittee reports or announcements? All right. In that case, we'll go on to. Um, I guess I combined the Andy, but um, with the announcements and subcommittee reports. So we'll go on to um, item number one, uh, miscellaneous action item. Uh, so this is a resolution of intention for 32 East you know, Paris Street, miscellaneous action item. Uh, so this is um, request for, of a possible historic structure shall be scheduled um, for hearing applicant concurrently with a duly noticed hearing to allow the commission to decide among the following options. One, listing on the potential historic resources list. Two, structure of merit designation. Or three, the landmark designation of the Spanish colonial style house constructed in 1929, located um, at 32 East Unipera Street. So, Ms. Hernandez. Oh, Ms. Um, Ms. Edmonds, did you want to need to say anything yes. before? Yes, I'm, I'm going to recuse myself from this item because Mr. Mitchell is a friend of mine. And um, okay. so I understand I'll turn my microphone off and my camera off and sit this one out. All right, sounds good. All right, Ms. Hernandez. Um, yes, this is just the resolution of intention to set the hearing, which would be for October 16th, as it has to be 75 days after the hearing, after this hearing. It is a 1929 house and I should give you a report that does show the original photograph and it still does retain a high amount of integrity that warrants um, that it does qualify as a historic resource. So I, it is up to the commission um, that they wanna um, move to add it to the potential list or designated a structure of merit or a landmark. I recommend um, designation as a structure of merit. Um, 
as that's the most streamlined process rather than having a hearing to add to them to the list and another hearing for designation. Uh, that's been what we've done for the past several years. Um, and it is because we heard the um, project on consent this morning. So in this hearing, we do need to decide um, one of the three as per our ordinance. So, and I did prepare a resolution of intention for structure merit designation for you, but if you decide one of the others, I can bring that back appropriately. All right. Thank you, um, uh, Commissioner Uli. Well, should, should we, let's go into public. Um, is that it, uh, Ms. Renetta? Okay, so let's open up the public comment and then we'll come to the commission. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Chair Grumbine. Just would ask that if you wish to speak on this item, so please raise your hand using the hand icon and I'll call on you and you'll have two minutes to speak. And I do not see anyone who wishes to speak at this time. And I'll ask Pilar or uh, Ms. Plummer if we received any written comment. Thank you, Ms. Kokinda. We didn't receive any public correspondence on this item. Okay. Thank you. All right. So now we'll bring it back to the commission for questions. Any questions, Commissioner Uli? I don't have any questions. All right, any questions? Going once? All right, All right. Commissioner Uli? Uh, and or... I'd like to move the resolution for uh, adding this property as a structure of merit. Okay. Second by House. Second by House. Okay. Uh, under discussion? Any discussion? Um, do, do you need the full language of it or is this, is this uh, adequate? Ms. Bonner. This is adequate for me. This is okay. adequate. Or, 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 All right. Yeah, this is Sounds adequate. good. All right. So then we'll do a roll call vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Heidi Rydello. We'll begin the roll call vote. Commissioner Lundvik? Yes. Commissioner Vena? Yes. Vice Chair House? Aye. Commissioner Mahan? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Edmonds is absent for this item. Uh, Commissioner Uli? Yes. Commissioner Drury? Yes. Chair Grumbine? Aye. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. All right. So with that, we'll go on to um, item two, 502 Olive Street, the miscellaneous action items, the landmark designation recommendation, uh, review of, uh, of designation report and public hearing to consider adoption resolution to recommend the city council of city landmark designation of St. Paul's AME Church, constructed in 1915 or 16 in the Carpenter Gothic style, along with the fellowship hall and parish hall as it is as significant as the home of one of the oldest African-American congregations in Santa Barbara. It is significant not only for its architectural significance, but also for its historical importance to the community of Santa Barbara. For over 117 years, the church has been a center of the African-American community in Santa Barbara. The St. Paul AME Church is the oldest of the six predominantly African-American churches scattered throughout the city that contribute to a unique architectural and cultural heritage of the city. All right. So, Ms. Hernandez? Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Um, I'm going to do a presentation on the landmark designation and how it meets the qualifications. And then I do know that um, Reverend Clark is here as well, and he would like to address the commission um, after the presentation. So, um, next slide, please. I do always begin this for the public's. Um, information the authority that we have for designating city landmarks so it begins with our city charter um that um had the, that the landmarks commission has the power and duty to recommend to city council certain structures features sites um, and areas having architectural archaeological and cultural and aesthetic significance be designated as a landmark next slide and we go and it also is outlined in our municipal code that further grants the HLC the authority to adopt resolutions to recommend to city council to designate city landmarks 
A city landmark does confer honor and recognition on structures contributing to the city's unique historical and architectural traditions. Next slide. And in our um, historic resources element of the general plan, it calls for continued identification, documentation, and designation of individual historic structures. In order to meet these goals, um, the HLC designation subcommittee selects candidates for city landmark designation from the city's potential historic resources list based on the importance to the heritage of the city. And then we hold the public hearing here to consider recommending the nominated property to city council, which would be the next step after the hearing today. Next slide. So um, today we're here to um, discuss the qualifications for St. Paul's AME Church. The um, building was actually voted to be added to the potential historic resources list in 1990 due to its architectural and historical significance to the city. At its meeting in July 11th in 2018, the Historic Landmarks Designations Committee nominated the church as an excellent candidate for landmark designation. At that time, I notified the church of the nomination and the church worked with um, their um, chapter and presiding district um, to discuss the nomination and they have I now support the designation and we have a letter from the 5th Episcopal District um, AME Church presiding bishop in support of the landmark designation. The nomination was um, prepared by Commissioner Uli and was assisted by um, historian Mary Louise Days, Hattie Bursford, as well as Mike and Wally and representatives from the St. Paul's AME Church. Um, and it is on a state parks and rec form. So um, I did want to just introduce, this is just a lovely um, historic photograph of the congregation in front of the church. And um, to begin with, there is, you know, no single institution was of great importance to the social history of the African-Americans in the church. Founded in 1903, St. Paul's African, American, African Methodist Episcopal Church was one of the first in Santa Barbara. Next slide. The church um, sits right on the corner of Olive and East Haley Streets. Um, the proposed boundary of the city landmark designation includes the entire parcel as there are three buildings taking up the majority of the parcel for the HLC to review. And to begin with, this next slide, we have the church, which is um, designed in the Carpenter's Gothic style. It was constructed in 1915. And next slide, we have the Fellowship Hall, which is attached to the church. Um, that was designed in the craftsman style in 1924, as well as the parsonage, which is next slide, was designed in the mission style in 1924. So next slide. The buildings and property meet five of the city landmark eligibility criteria for um, architectural style and historic significance as outlined in our municipal code. And we'll have the next slide. Um, I just um, added this mural that's on the inside of the church that um, is um, not under the jurisdiction of the HLC, but we often look at significant features in the designation process as it helps express the importance of the heritage of the building to the community. The building is significant to the um, heritage of Santa Barbara because it's among the few constructed in the Carpenter Gothic style that still remains standing while branded the style of the city's Spanish colonial revival, the lesser celebrated styles have their place in the family and architectural styles that make up the broad fabric of the heritage of Santa Barbara. Further, the richness of culture and strength of community among African Americans in Santa Barbara, and particularly this site, provide depth and bring life to what draws tens of thousands of tourists to the area every year. St. Paul's AME was well connected to the Black Church in Los Angeles and nationally, taking a leadership role in the Western AME Conference. By 1915, St. Paul's had enough funds to build a new edifice. They decided it should be located on the same site as the little wood frame church they had originally constructed in 1906. The original church seated a modest 50 people for public and private meetings. In 1916, through the congregation had grown and funds were limited, the congregation chose Carpenter Gothic as a style from which to build. It could be done easily at a modest $3,500, yet still had the features representing an important icon in the community with its steeple overlooking the corner, calling its congregation, as seen in many neighborhood hits churches dotting the nation. Still a great sum of money for a small church, it raised the funds 
with the effort of the congregation from offering chicken dinners to bake sales and direct appeals to the community at large. The church has a legacy left a moral imprint on the surrounding neighborhood of the Lower East Side. Members of the congregation fought restrictive housing covenants and racial discrimination in many forms, from public beaches, swimming pools, and restaurants. Members of the congregation were active in the NAACP and helped raise legal defense funds to pay for the printing of briefs used in the arguments before the United States Court in Brown versus Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas, that desegregated the public schools. The members were also first to enter Pardon, pardon me, interruption, um, Nicole. The fabric of the Santa Barbara community and the compelling experience. Nicole, Nicole, can you turn off my webcam? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. We, um, you had just started on a new section or a paragraph and um we were the audio was cut out so i just want to make sure that if you could go back and maybe turn your webcam off so that we can get good audio quality thank you okay i turned my webcam off i hope that you can hear me that's better so thank the mural you. was um okay the mural was inspired by uh church service at St. Paul's Amy Church in 1936. It was um, painted by Lilia Tuckerman um, of these angels singing spirituals. She was not a member of the church, but she enjoyed the energy that the church exhibited the day she attended. Um, and next slide. So um, the church um, also is identified with um, people who have significantly contributed to the culture of the development of the city. Um, there's quite a few people to mention here, so I'm just going to go through some um, few key stories because I think they're really important to note, and this is the time to really honor this um, in our hearing. There was Jerry Forney, who was the first, um, one of the first born into slavery on a plantation in North Carolina and one of the first um, to be freed in, free American, African Americans in Santa Barbara as he gained his freedom when he moved to California. Um, and he um, also was an advocate for free black people and worked very hard to find their way from North Carolina to California in 1876 during the Centennial Parade um, down State Street. He rode a mule draped in an American flag and he wore metal shackles unlocked to show he was a free man. There was also Nathaniel Hill instrumental in helping acquire the site where the St. Paul's AME Church stands today. The Sims family has a long history of community involvement. Um, the Sims, Bill Sims' mother was the first Black woman to enter the Santa Barbara Police Department, and her sister was the first to be a Black banker. Willie Rowan was a civil rights proponent who fought for racial equality with the National Association for Advanced of Color People, which is the NAACP, in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Reverend Silas. L. Wright was among the first ministers of the church. Um, he is important to the development of the church, includes the purchase of this site and the vision for the congregation. Anita Johnson Mackey is a community develop a community leader and nationally recognized social service worker. And she also was the first instructor for the overwhelmingly popular course of African American culture at Santa Barbara City College. Um, Dr. Shirley Grace Kennedy, PhD, was integral in the establishment of the Black Studies Department at UCSB. And Herman and Val Valencia Nelson began delivering surplus food um, to the Hungry East Side residents. Their efforts helped form the Food Bank of Santa Barbara. And Dr. Hollis McMullen, MD, who I pictured here, although all the, there are much more pictures in the nomination form, was the first black pharmacist mate in the United States Coast Guard. He arrived in 1952 to Santa Barbara, and he was one of the four founding members of the Family Medical Center on Arriaga Street. He helped start the Franklin Neighborhood Center and fought for equality of housing. As a physician on staff at both Cottage and St. Francis Hospitals, he managed to stop the St. Francis practice of segregating black patients. Along with other general practitioners, McMillan was one of the founding members of the Goleta Valley Community Hospital. As a center of the black community, the church meets criterion C as associated with many people that significantly contributed to the culture of Santa Barbara. Next slide. 
The building um, is in it. The buildings are examples of architectural styles important to the culture of the city. The, as we mentioned, the church is in the Carpenter's Gothic style um, constructed by a local builder, likely with the help of members of the congregation. As that was the way many vernacular corner churches that serve as anchors of the community were constructed during the period. Many residential small farm buildings and churches were constructed with the <clears throat> neighborhood pitching in to help um, architect technical patterns of the Carpenter Gothic was one that could be executed with simple tools and modest means. There are not many of these buildings in Santa Barbara, even fewer nationally by population. The simple detailing and use of common materials in the day is what makes this building unique within the family of architectural styles, and even more so with the city's global identity with Spanish colonial revival. Carpenter Gothic exhibits few key elements that distinguish it from other styles, including the Gothic shape, um, pointed arches that uh, take form above the windows, doors, and trim work, and the steep roof slopes. A Gothic shape, more accurately called the bishop's hat shape, take form of the shape of the hat worn by the church bishops of medieval days. And the hat manifests itself on this building in the transom windows and grilled openings of the belfry. Next slide. The fellowship hall and classroom addition <clears throat> were done in 1924 in the craftsman style. This building has character defining features of the style with horizontal siding on the first floor and shingle siding on the second floor, wood trim around the doors and windows, low rise sloped roofs, and extending eaves with angled rafter tails. This was a very popular um, style in Santa Barbara and California from 1905 through the 1930s. And the Parsonage Hall is in the next slide, is in the Mission Revival style which was an architectural movement drew inspiration from the late 18th and early 19th century missions in California. It enjoyed a great popularity between 1890 and 1815 in numerous residential, commercial, and institutional structures. And we see them dotted throughout Santa Barbara. They fit with the vision of the style for the city residents, and many could be fitting in that style with modest means. Next slide. Um, the, since its construction in 1915, the church has been a landmark to African American community and acts as an anchor and gateway to the neighborhood. It serves and has served as a base for central gathering place for over a century, a place where babies were celebrated, where the death of a loved one was honored, and, and a place of witness to marriage vows, a place to celebrate and praise and fellowship together. And next slide. Um, it is really difficult to talk about the importance of this nomination outside of the context of discrimination. The blatant and forceful segregation of black prisoners in the 18, in the 1780s and 1790s is what led to the erection of the African Methodist Episcopal Church by Richard Allen, Absalom Jones, and Daniel Coker, and others. Here in Santa Barbara, for almost 117 years, the site has been associated, associated with the tight-knit African-American community. This was not only a house of worship for the community, but it was among the first to be established. And next slide. Um, so the building has high historic integrity and still has integrative location, feeling, setting, design, materials, and association from its original 1915 construction and 1924 for the Paratal and Parsonage. And um, we look to the HLC to make a recommendation to city council to designate the church as a city landmark. So that concludes my presentation. Um, and I encourage you, anybody who hasn't, to review the nomination. It is posted online and it is much more in depth than my brief overview. Great. And I Thank do you, believe. Fernando. And then we have Reverend Clark here, and he would like to say some words to the commission. All right. And may I just ask that Reverend Clark uh, turn on your webcam and your audio? It looks like you've done it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Commissioner and ladies and gentlemen of the commission. Uh, I'm Reverend Jeffrey Clark. I'm currently assigned uh, pastor of St. Paul Emmy Church uh, in Santa Barbara. Uh, as we began to uh, look at this designation, uh, the history record shows that on December 7th of 1915, the members of St. Paul Emmy Church decided that the structure wasn't uh, adequate or inadequate, and it did not uh, show the significance that the church wanted to make in the city. 
And so in August of 1916, the construction of the current uh, building was finished with the addition in 1924 of the Fellowship Hall and the uh, Parsonage. Since then, the members have done a marvelous job of keeping that notion lit of making St. Paul a place of significance uh, in the city of Santa Barbara, both aesthetically and spiritually. And now some 114 years after the structure was erected, their foresight is being considered by, uh, for designation of a landmark in the city of Santa Barbara. So it is in the spirit of those idealists, I want to thank you for your consideration on behalf of the Right Reverend Clement W. Few, presiding prelate of the 5th Episcopal District, the Reverend Dr. Alan L. Williams, presiding elder of the Los Angeles North District, the members and the office of St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church. I also want to thank those supporters who brought this to the attention of city officials, as well as those who worked tirelessly to put the package together. I hope and pray that you will give full consideration to our submittal. Thank you very much for this opportunity to address the commission. Great, thank you. All right, and if um, I, and I think if we could um, uh, maybe have you available afterwards for questions that might come up as well um, after we do public comment, um, Reverend Clark, Absolutely, then uh, sir. I think that'd be great. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, with that, does that conclude the presentation and we can go to public comment? So if following the signs here, if you can um, raise your hand, if you would like to comment on this item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so yes, as Mr. Chair mentioned, please raise your hand using the hand icon and you'll have two minutes to speak. I see Mary Louise Days. Uh, I have just unmuted you and it looks like your microphone's on whenever you're ready. Thank you. It was a great pleasure for me to work on this project uh, as a volunteer. I would also like to point out uh, and have noted that Hattie Bearsford uh, put in a great deal of volunteer time uh, preparing the timeline and many, many other aspects of, of research that uh, she and uh, the rest of us worked on. She will have some uh, articles about this uh, in the up some upcoming issues of the Montecito Journal weekly and uh, quite soon, I think, I hope that you will uh, enjoy reading those and uh, we certainly do support the uh, proposed landmark um, designation, which has been studied for a long time. I did, I supervised the 1990 survey work, which first uh, um, indicated in, in the city survey forms, the importance of this uh, structure and institution. Thank you. Thank you. And then next I have uh, Mr. Richard Clausen. Uh, Mr. Clausen, I've just unmuted you and it looks like your microphone is live whenever you're ready. Um, uh, thanks very much. And first of all, thank you for the commission's forbearance on my previous comments, which I expect ran long. I'll be brief here. Um, as uh, you've heard me say before, I'm always interested in the proper visibility of uh, city designated structures for their full public appreciation. And in an early image uh, that uh, urban historian Hernandez uh, presented, um, it showed that there seemed to be a, an extremely tall hedge very close to the main church structure. And I wondered if that hedge is on the church's property, if it's of an acceptable height, and uh, if it's on the property line, uh, is the structure within the usual setback uh, that would require a minor modification uh, going forward? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'm just going to, one last chance, I don't see any other hands raised, but if you wish to speak on this item, to please raise your hand using the hand icon. Um, Mr. Sweeney, I see that you've just uh, raised your hand. If you could unmute yourself, Mr. Sweeney, using the microphone icon. 
There you go. And whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, uh, board and HLC. This is Fred Sweeney. Um, I'm a retired uh, senior design partner with a firm called now called 1906, it's the oldest architectural firm in Santa Barbara. We've actually, uh, Windsor Sewell designed one of the other uh, churches that is being considered for designation. Uh, I've spent some time the last few weeks sketching and documenting this particular church and hope very soon to provide a gift watercolor of the church to uh, Reverend Clark. Uh, but in the process of doing that, what became apparent to me is that there are several churches and properties in the Haley Milpas corridor along Coda Street and other streets in the city where some of these churches, some that have not been taken care of as well as this church has, but need our attention. It's a part of an effort I think we need to do re revisiting and updating the Haley Milpas corridor design guidelines and looking at a master plan, but also assisting some of those churches and church properties along Haley. There are several, if you carefully look, in CODA and how to make uh, their importance to the contribution to this city uh, over the many years that they've been in session, both for the black and brown communities um, that make a, a greater part of contribution to who we are as Santa Barbarans. So I would hope the HLC uh, moves in that direction and reinforces the need to take careful look at this section of our city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. And uh, those are all the hands that I saw raised. I would just ask Ms. Plummer if we received any written public comment for this item. And Ms. Gokind, I don't have any additional written correspondence. Thank you. Great. All right. So with that, we'll close public comment and back to the commission for questions. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Drury. Um, yes, I have a, the, so all three buildings were constructed before the earthquake in 1925. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, Mr. Commissioner Drury. And do, is there was there any damage to all any of those buildings? I believe there was minor damage. There was some permits in 1925 that listed minor repairs. Oh, good. Well, thank you. That's all, that's my only question. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Drury. All right. Any other questions? All right. In that case, let's roll into uh, comments. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Drury. Unless Ms. Kokinda needs to say something. I would just like oh, to yeah. invite all of the uh, commissioners, now that you're in deliberation or comment portion, to please turn on your webcams if you have them. Um, just for to utilize the ability to do that. Thank you. All right. No matter which button I push, I still don't have a, a face. I on don't see you, Commissioner Drury. <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe you can just, send a carrier just, pigeon with your picture. It's just as well for everybody. Um, well, I think this is long overdue, and I'm so sorry that it took such a tragedy to get this ball rolling. And it's a wonderful church. My mother and I, my father used to go there when I was a child. My mother believed that all all worships of God were valid and so I went to every church in the city and we spent a lot of time because it was such a beautiful place and the services were so lovely and we were always treated with the most utmost welcome and respect. I'm, I'm really, really glad that this wonderful building is is up for well, what the landmark status. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Commissioner Gray. Uh, Commissioner Uli? Um, any Commissioner House? Well, I can't say anything to match Commissioner Drury's eloquence, but I will say it's about time. And I am very proud to be uh, on this commission at a time where we can designate and recognize this, uh, this church as a Santa Barbara city landmark. All right, thank you. Commissioner Mahan, any additional comment? I echo those same comments. This is. Uh... This is very exciting, and and I think we're all uh, 
really happy that this is happening. All right, Commissioner Vena. I too am very elated about the entire process and the church itself. I, I'm very happy to see it on our list. Thank you. Okay. And uh, let's see, is there any, Commissioner Edmonds, did you have any comments? And I'm not sure who else I'm missing, anyone. Commissioner Lendick. Oh, Commissioner Lendick, yes. Because uh, I concur with what uh, the others have said. It's um, it's a beautiful church, and um, I think it will be uh, uh, well well uh, appreciated for a long time in our community. Great, Ms. Redman. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm so sorry. I'm all of a sudden having issues here. Oh, there we are. Um, um, you know. I'm, I'm, as you've heard me say before, an, a native um, like Commissioner Drury and um, spent a lot of time in, the, in this part of the area because my grandparents had started a business in 1948 just down the street. So I too am delighted and I'm so sorry that it has taken so long. And I echo what Commissioner House said. Um, I'm delighted to be on the commission at a time when I can place my vote. Mr. Chair. Right. And uh, Commissioner the House. House, yes. Lest we forget, compliments to all that were involved in the preparation yeah. of this yeah. fantastic report. It's, it's one to keep for the ages. I I agree. And uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Commissioner Uli, Mary Louise Days, Mike and Wally, and many others that have been all contributing to getting this um, pulled together in a very, very short time and a great report. Um, and, uh, and for my own comments as well, it's also an additional interest of um, of having multiple different styles of structures all as part of one um, of one uh, church and one uh, facility that has also carried through. So it has um, a lot of depth in a lot of different ways. Um, and so it, and as I've, I'm hearing from the commission as well, um, I'm very much in, in favor of um, uh, putting it forward to be a landmark. So um, does someone want to? Ms. Mr. Chair? Make, yes, Commissioner Drury. Yes, I'd like to make one more comment. I hope this is the beginning of a, a survey of the contributions of the African American community in Santa Barbara in terms of structures. I'd like to see um, a real uh, push to um, aggrandize our knowledge of, of this culture. And I, I hope, I suspect it will, but I hope it does. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gary. And along those lines, uh, there there has already been some discussion um, uh, with the, the designation committee from previously about um, doing something very much along those lines. So stay tuned as, as things get developing. Um, so. Chair. All right, Commissioner Mahan. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to uh, designate this St. Paul's AME Church as a city landmark. Second. All right. I. Uh, I saw House first, um, first from the second. Um, so, uh, and any under uh, under discussion? Is that the appropriate motion to make, or should it be to forward it to City Council for forward City Council for? Correct. Forward to City Council is the correct. Language. All right, Mr. Mahan, accept that change. Yes. Mr. House, second it. Okay. So in that case, uh, roll call vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Heidi Rydell. I will begin the roll call vote. Commissioner Vena? Yes. Vice Chair House? Aye. Commissioner Mahan? Yes. Commissioner Edmonds? Yes. Commissioner Uli? Yes. Commissioner Drury? Yes. Commissioner Lenvik? Yes. Chair Grumbine? Aye. That is unanimous. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And thank you all for all of your work to make it so. Um, all right. On to item number three, uh, 710, uh, 720 State Street, 1519 East Ortega Street, miscellaneous action item, historic significance determination. This is a project site adjacent to designated city landmark, Daily News, constructed in 1922 by George Washington Smith and contains two buildings in the city's list of potential historic resources, 714 State Street, um, reconstructed in 1925. 
by um, Sauter and Walker and 1718 State Street, constructed uh, in 1925 by, by Sewell, Murphy, and Hastings. The proposals to merge the properties at 710 to 720 State Street and 1519 East Ortega Street to create a 30,000 square foot lot. The proposal development involves demolition of the commercial building at 710 State Street and 1519 East Ortega and construction of a new approximately 39,000 square foot three and four story mixed use buildings with a maximum height of 48 feet. The new buildings will be comprised of 2,300 square feet of commercial space and 36 rental units, um, averaging 700 square feet per unit um, using the AUD uh, program. The proposal includes a new ground floor parking garage consisting of 16 parking spaces, 15 residential, one commercial, trash enclosure, transformer, and bicycle parking. Planning commission review is required for community benefit project exceptions to height limitations, a parking modification, an open yard modification, and a lot area modification for additional density. Uh, this is a review of a staff report and public hearing to consider conclusions of staff report and HLC sub, uh, designation subcommittee that the building at 15 East Ortega Street does not qualify for the criteria outlined in the Santa Barbara Municipal Code to be considered a historic structure or historic resource. All right, and Ms. Hernandez. Okay, I'm gonna um, go through the um, criteria really quickly, but I'm gonna turn off my video because I don't think my internet's very strong today for some reason. Um, we found the building was not on the potentials list um, nor identified as having potential for historic significance on the local, state, or national level. It was constructed in 1925 as a plumbing supply shop. Um, it is a one-story brick structure um, with a vernacular storefront. Um, it um, went through a variety of uses, um, including being um, a office for the news press building. The building next door that the news press had was also used um, for um, sort of the industrial part of the news press, like storage of paper and the printing. So this block did not really see the high style architecture and Spanish colonial revival um, architects designing the street like the, we saw around the corner of State Street and other parts of El Pueblo Viejo. This tended to be a little more vernacular and um, used for more um, practical um, back of house sort of uses. And more significantly, um, in 1993, there was a, a plan that took out the original storefront and put in the existing storefront. So we don't have an original storefront any longer as well. Um, however, you know, it has been occupied by the press club, which is how it was originally titled in 1994, now the press room, which is a successful business that's an important gathering place for the community, but um, that is not really, we look at things over 50 years old typically. So as I went through the um, criteria, I found um, it really has not acquired um, any significance to the heritage of the city. Um, it's not associated with a significant event. It's not identified with any significant people to the community. The vernacular storefront does not exhibit the a particular architectural style and has changed owners and uses um, since 1925 construction. So it does not exemplify a way of life important to the city. It's not exemplification. It's an exemplification of a vernacular storefront, but not with a specific style. And it's not the original storefront or original design. Um, no architects or designers or contractors are associated with it. It does not embody any original elements that demonstrate outstanding attention to detail. Um, it is part of the El Pueblo Viejo district. However, it does not contribute to the integrity of the district as it does not retain its own integrity to convey its significance. And due to the new storefront, it does not rep represent an established familiar feature to the neighborhood. So I did present this to the designation subcommittee and they concurred that we do not find the building um, historically significant. And um, we need the commission to vote on confirming with that conclusion in order to um, decide on the historic significance of the building. All right. Does that conclude your presentation? It does. Thank you. All right. 
In that case, I will now uh, open public comment. Any member of the public wishing to comment on this item, please uh, virtually raise your hand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And if I could just ask Timmy, it looks like we might have a delay. Thank you, Timmy. Um, I see Travis Vasallo has raised, you, you've raised your hand. I've just unmuted you. If you could please unmute yourself by using the microphone icon on your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, yes, you just click on, there's a little green, or there's a microphone icon that looks, um, that should be gray right now. Um, Travis Vasallo, if you're able to click on that microphone icon, you'll then be it looks like, uh, whenever you're ready, we've got audio. Um, you have two minutes. Hello, just wanna thank everybody for taking some time again. Um, I did submit some more paperwork. We now have just shy of 12,000 signatures um, on people that do not want to see this building demolished. Just to put that in perspective, uh, the last mayoral race, um, Catherine Murillo garnished 6,000 uh, votes. Frank Hoshkis only 4,500. The top two people in the mayoral race didn't even get as many votes as we have for people that want to save the press room. So just want to put that in perspective. Um, additionally, on the report that Nicole Hernandez filed, I wanted to mention that as of, as many of the commission members probably know, as of just a year ago, uh, all the historical findings were done through outside consultants. And it's now been turned to interior people doing it. I'm not discrediting Nicole's ability to do it, but I can tell you that I have a private firm looking into it. And we do have reason to believe that the building does go back much further than 1925. As you many of you know, the Sunborn um, maps, there's a plethora of them all saying different things. Um, so we do think that the building does go back well beyond that. We do know it's withstood the 1925 earthquake. So um, I'll be looking into that and I can submit things to you additionally. Um, just one other thing on a personal note, as a cultural relevance building in Santa Barbara, I think it's extremely terrible to lose something where so many of the community rally around and support each other with everything, whether it's through friendship, through getting together during fires, through, you know, supporting each other during various Black Lives Matter rallies or, you know, really any kind of charitable thing. Preston has always been a key, a key place for the community to really rally behind. And it would be a giant tragedy to lose that little bit of what helps make Santa Barbara Santa Barbara. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then next I have Darcy Roberts, and I'll just uh, remind everybody if you wish to speak to please raise your hand using the hand icon. Uh, Darcy Roberts, I've just unmuted you. If you could please unmute yourself using the microphone icon on your GoToWebinar control panel. It looks like you just did, and you have two minutes whenever you're ready. Hi folks, um, Darcy Roberts, and again, thank you, uh, uh, like Travis said, for taking the time to uh, go over this. I would like to second what he said about having a different um, uh, different assessment. And again, not that you know we're disregarding what we've heard today, but also to just have someone with an outside understanding <clears throat> of the situation to take a look at it. I think that that would be important considering how many people are invested in the situation at the moment. And again, I know like you like said before is about the historical landmark. I think it does pose a, a cultural space for people like just in the cultural history of Santa Barbara and just to continue to look at the ways that we dismantle the parts that make Santa Barbara special every time we make decisions like this. So thank you very much and I hope you have a wonderful day. See you in my time. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, that is the last person that I see who's raised their hand. Oh, never mind. I'm sorry. Um, I have Nicole Miller. Nicole, I've just unmuted you, Nicole Miller, and it looks like I have a couple more hands coming in. Uh, Nicole, it looks like your microphone is on whenever you're ready. Thank you. Hi, I just wanted to um, chime in and also thank you for listening to us once again. Um, um, and I also wanted to agree with um, Travis Vasallo and Darcy Roberts in terms of maybe just, you know, we do trust in Nicole's research and everything, but maybe just like you said before, there were outside resources, and I do also believe the building was built before 1925, um, as well as, most importantly, just focusing on the significance of the cultural 
um, representation. Nicole said something, I, I didn't catch it exactly because I tuned in a little late about 50 years of a business being open, kind of making it established in the community. Well, I can tell you the press room family doesn't plan on going anywhere anytime soon. It's a family owned business. Um, the kids are very involved. Um, everybody in the family works there. I could see this business lasting another hundred years easily in Santa Barbara being passed on to the children, the grandchildren of the Rafferty family. Um, it is a great place for the community to come together, all cultures, all races. Um, it does have a big following um, in just different times of need for the community. They do a lot of donations towards charities in this community, especially during the times of the World Cup where they put all the flags up and all the flags are um, auctioned off and donated to a local charity, um, as well as just, you know, they it just means a lot to the community. And I do, like you said, if you can get 12,000 votes for a business and you can get that much for the two top mayoral candidates, that says a lot. So thank you for your time and please take that into consideration. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I see two more hands raised. I see um, I'm going to call on Joseph Crosby first and then Mr. Richard Clausen. So Joseph Crosby, I've just unmuted you. If you could please unmute yourself using, there you go. It looks like uh, whenever you're ready, you have two minutes. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your time today. I want to reiterate everything that's already been said by the last four speakers. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a Santa Barbara resident. I'm born and raised here. And I've got to say that in my time living as a Santa Barbarian, there are very few businesses that have been able to withstand economic hardships, challenges that city, county, or state, or now globe may be facing. And the press room is one of them. It's one of the ones that will stand up and stand out as a safe haven, a good place to go. You know, I work in the nightlife industry. I, I don't work at the press room, but I work at another place that has been around a long time. There are very few places at night where someone can go and be somewhere quiet and, and just relax. I know that everyone that's coming in is going to meet you where you're at and there's no race, creed or color that isn't welcome. It's a community spot. And in this time of economic hardship, I think it's a travesty that someone's considering taking down a wonderful business when we need pillars in this community showing that business is strong and business can thrive if we have county and city support. I also want to remind everyone what's already been said. We've had a lot of supporters come out and say, please don't do anything to the press room. More than 12,000 people speaking their voice. I just want to reiterate once again, what something all of you know, it only took how many thousand votes for the mayor to become mayor or city council members to become city council members. That's a lot of supporters of the press room. Please take that into consideration when making your decisions about this place. Thank you. Okay, next um, I have Mr. Richard Clausen and then Bryson Smith after Mr. Clausen. So Mr. Clausen, um, your mic is on whenever you're ready. Um, thanks very much. Um, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, for the other public uh, viewers, the uh, the dilemma that uh, HLC uh, is in now, because the uh, the decision bears heavily on the progress of a large AUD project, and so this is not an easy decision to make. Um, however, the the, um, the suggestion that there are outside consultants willing to donate their research into the building. I think is a very interesting twist. And I say that with the fullest respect for uh, urban historian uh, Hernandez's work, um, but, but I never turned down uh, a, an offer of uh, free free research. Um, and so I think that that could be um, a worthwhile uh, addition to, um, to the history of the building. Um, secondly, though, I, I wonder about the uh, 12,000 uh, signatures on a petition. If it were an uh, online petition, I know that I've been involved with some of those that have worldwide distribution, and uh, I, I'd be interested to know how many of those are actual standard barbarians or how many are people that uh, are friends of friends of friends of barbarians. Um, and uh, it's not a big point. It's just that I'm not sure that 
comparing 12,000 signatures on a petition to votes in the mayoral contest is a, is a valid uh, uh, comparison. I just think that uh, this is taking an interesting turn of events, and I wonder whether the commission has an opportunity to defer its final decision until um, that outside research is able to be um, viewed and uh, vetted. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, next I have Bryson Smith. Uh, Mr. Smith, if you could unmute yourself. There you go. Um, you have two minutes whenever you're ready. Cool. Hi there, uh, Bryson Smith. I'm a longtime Santa Barbara resident and uh, just really quickly wanted to share a, a sentiment that I and I think a lot of community members have. Uh, we've already heard from a lot of people expressing love and support from the press room. Um, but I would like to speak directly to the historical significance. I think that uh, history is something that we create every day and that while this commission is uh, kind of in the business of reviewing history in a 50 year time period or, or longer, whatever uh, established time periods uh, exist, but the press room in that current building at 15 East Ortega Street has been there for 25 years. And we can tell a story 25 years from now about how a uh, local business has occupied a quite old building for 50 years, or we can tell a story about how the Santa Barbara City Council and then, you know, by extension, other commissions decided to, uh, to steamroll it and knock it down to put in a couple of parking spaces. Um, so I think that, well, maybe this isn't the uh, historical time frame that we're uh, accustomed to worrying about times change and five years from now it'll be a, an older building an older business 10 years from now older so I think we should just uh, keep that in mind as we take into consideration what is history and what is not thank you see my time all right thank you and it right. appears that that was our last uh, speaker and uh, I'll ask uh, Ms. Plummer, do we have any written correspondence? Thank you, Ms. Coquindo. We did receive one written correspondence um, from Steve Fort, and I'll just summarize. Uh, the city should consider tenant displacement assistance in cases like this when a long standing existing business is being displaced to accommodate a downtown housing project. Um, if the existing displaced business wants to relocate, they should waive the plan check fees and expedite the plan check at the new location. Um, the city has a residential tenant displacement ordinance, um, but should consider a business displacement ordinance in this case. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so with that, we will close public comment and back to the commission for questions. Mr. Chair? Yes, Commissioner Drury. Michael Drury here. Um, yes, this is for um, Nicole um, Hernandez. Is E.T. Edwards part of the Edwards and Plunkett firm? Um, thank you, Commissioner Jury and Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioners. I did research that. I did not find any connection. They are not the same. So not, not connected? No. Okay. But an architect that, that not in my research and um, I did not find that. And I did is there, and in your, was there any hint that that was a building there before this building was built or is it a refurbished after the earthquake? Well, I, I found the original building permit that's the 1925 building this structure for a plumbing supply shop and so, and so there's no the chance that it, there's no chance that it's more than 95 years yeah. old there there's a slight one there's um you know i did look at sanborn maps as well but um our building permits from 1925 are pretty vague it says building it's, it did say new construction. I have a copy of it and I can send it to you. Um, it does have the architect listed and this is what they said they did is a new building built for a plumbing supply. Okay. Um, it did not say repair on that. So I went by that and I tried to double check it just to make sure because um, my, you know, it was rare to build a brick building in 1925 because that was 
the earthquake kind of took down all the brick buildings we had. Um, but that was what I could find, and it did look like an original building permit from scratch. So, okay, well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, other questions? Um, I had a question uh, regarding, um, well, regarding kind of general um, uh, procedures. Um, so, and I think I know the answer, but I want to know from staff um, if, I'm, if I'm right in this. Um, so, at, and as a general rule, say for example, let's make up a scenario that um, it was, it was a, a fact, but just not uncovered that someone extremely famous uh, was, you know, lived here, grew up here, or died here, um, and was, the site itself was famous for some other reason um, that was not uh, known. Um, and uh, with the historic structures report, even, you know, from whether it's from staff or whether it's from an outside um, historian that does a, a, a much more, a much deeper dive and a, a big full report, um, uh, obviously, um, some information might be new information, might come up new later. Um, and so it, a conclusion might change based on new information that comes up uh, for a historic structures report. So, um, and in general, we, because historic structures report are a very expensive, um, or at least more, a lot more expensive, um, and uh, take a, a greater amount of time, um, we, are, we have not, and it's been for a couple of years now, um, we have not uh, required them for any um, declaration or for all declarations, I should say, of um, structures of merit or um, historic resources. Um, and but you, but uh, I think I don't think there has been a single. Um, uh, and I might be wrong with that. Um, uh, uh, landmark that has been designated without being a, a full historic structures report, but I could be I could be wrong about that as well. Um, but the main point is, if there is new information that comes up with a new historic structures report um, that from an outside source or from other, any source um, that can be the building can be reconsidered as long as obviously as long as it's still around it can be re reconsidered and, and affect it um, and affect whatever hasn't happened um, and affect also our decisions even um, at, a pre at an earlier time uh, because of new information is that a good kind of summary of of what the what might might happen in different situations obviously this is a situation in front of us but um, You're tremendous. right. Yes. So, um, you know, I am a certified by the um, Department of the Interior as an architectural historian with a master's in architectural history. And, um, you know, I, I do, I don't do them as thorough as the historic structures reports. Again, those are about $10,000 and delay a project a couple months. And the commission, or I can always call one when we are in a gray zone and are not quite clear and we want more research. Um, at the last meeting, you guys thought this would be the good step and all we needed for this. We can call the larger report. Um, with this expertise on staff, we try and streamline the process for the owners and applicants to help move the project along. But we can always, when projects change or get more complicated, can call those structures reports. Um, we again, I have been doing these since I started eight years ago, and I have designated quite a few landmarks without a full structures report, including the um, the Julia or the Julia Morgan building, as well as the Luda Rig building that we've designated recently, to name a few, and the um, Pittman building we did last year. So we do do a lot without them, mostly because of the cost. Um, the city does not want to incur real financial hardship on applicants and wants to streamline our process as much as possible with always knowing that the commission has the overriding rule to say we want a little more and that is your decision when um, a, a report comes in if the commission does not agree with it and we're at a standstill it goes into an EIR which will get even further um, research and cost all at the applicant's expense um, and all the consultants that do work on structures reports do have to follow the format of the MEA and meet our qualifications to be heard by the commission. So if the applicant team, usually the applicant pays for the report, um, but if a private person wants to, they should look at our 
um, consultant list and work from that list unless they have a consultant that qualifies and needs to be added to the list. Um, and then, the and then just to be clear, list. just to be clear on if there, uh, if there's a, this report accepted or other report accepted, and then later there's more information that someone wants to bring forward in a, in another report and things can be reviewed at that point as well. Um, if, because obviously I think we've had some of that as well from one historic structures report, things have to be reevaluated or if there's new information or whatever year, even years later, that can be a, different conclusions can be reached. If there was something new found, um, typically it's a, it's a cutoff, right? Right. Well, you know, it's typically every 10 years we relook at because people's eyes of history change. Um, however, this building is up for demolition. So we really can't evaluate that project until we make a firm vote by this commission that, that it's one way or the other or go through the EIR process that it's because they need to be able to move on with their project or not. So we can't like say, well, we'll decide it later because the, we have to have that firm decision so that the applicant can appropriately move forward with their project or change their project. Okay, great. So we, need uh, Commissioner to Uli? we need them to get going and moving quickly so we can get that yep. evaluated. Yep. Uh, thank you. Commissioner Uli? Mm -hmm. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just an observation. I realize this is not an environmental hearing, but uh, if the commission uh, is looking for um, some comfort in order to delay the decision on this particular matter today or otherwise. Um, you know, CEQA, California uh, Environmental Quality Act, uh, has a provision in it that if there are two experts, more than one expert, they disagree, uh, then CEQA requires that further study uh, be done in order to resolve the conflict between the two experts. Uh, we have an, a city expert who's um, uh, made an opinion uh, that the designation uh, subcommittee agreed with, and we have uh, the suggestion by public comment that there's another expert that disagrees with that. We didn't hear from that expert. Uh, we heard through hearsay about what that expert thinks. Um, so it would seem to me um, that that we ought to have some material, um, maybe further study, or uh, maybe there's a letter that this other expert can write uh, uh, that makes the case uh, uh, in contrary to what we believe is the history now uh, in order for the commission to move forward. Uh, I'm happy to, you know, uh, to uh, uh, delay the matter, uh, uh, table it or whatever, uh, continue it uh, in order to get more information. All right, thank you, Commissioner, really, Commissioner Lendick. Uh, yes, I wanted to kind of uh, restate what Nicole said, and I hope that the that the people out there who are volunteering uh, an additional study or whatever realize this that their expert has to be. Uh, either qualify to the city standards or be on the current city's list of approved historians to be able to uh, submit a credible uh, report. And what I, what I kind of heard the, the, the uh, members of the public uh, speak to is they felt the building was more than, older than uh, 1925. And I'm not sure that makes any difference it could be 1920, it could be whatever, but you know, we have 11 criteria under the municipal code section 22220040 by which we judge whether or not a building qualifies as a structure of merit. And none of these 11 simply say the building is old and therefore it qualifies. None of these 11 say, gosh, we got an awful lot of people who pass through this business day in, day out, um, and like it, that doesn't qualify it for a structure of merit designation. Um, if you read the the 11 qualifications, one of the 11 qualifications, one of which has to uh, be met, uh, I have not heard anything, nor have I seen anything, which would lead me to believe that simply because it's a popular social gathering place, 
that it qualifies as a structure of merit. And I think that's the real, the real, you know, question. Does it does it have the ability to qualify under the criteria under Code Section 2222040, or it doesn't? And I think we should look at that, understand that, know what those criteria are, and move ahead with our decision today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lemick. And I guess it seems like we're rolling uh, uh, questions and comments together right now, but um, let's, uh, because there's, there is a complexity to this issue, I will keep going, but please uh, let's, tr let's try to focus as many questions as we can first so we can kind of get into our comments. Commissioner, Commissioner Edmonds. Uh, well, based on the last two um, commissioners speaking, I thought we had rolled into, even though you didn't say it into comments, <laughs> a comment. Yeah. So I can, I'll wait. Okay, let's see if we can get any other questions out first, um, and then we'll and then let's have the, the discussion after. Any other questions, Commissioner House? Do you have any questions? Okay. Um, all right. Well, if there's no other questions, um, then uh, we'll go comments, Commissioner House, and then Commissioner Edmonds. Okay. Well, I was going to say that I think that it's important that the commission balance the interests of both the uh, applicant for the project as well as the community. And unless there's an adverse impact on the applicant by uh, postponing this decision for two weeks, I think it's important that the commission appear responsive to the community uh, and give the community the opportunity to come forth with new information in case that changes uh, the outcome of this decision. So uh, I would be interested in, in continuing the, uh, the matter for two weeks. I don't want to do it overly long because if there's somebody that wants to speak to this, uh, I think they can round them up in two weeks time. But, and I don't uh, imagine that would be an adverse impact on the applicant. Thank you. I just don't think it'll take more than six weeks four to six weeks to run through a structures report. They have they take about a month to prepare and then they have to be reviewed by staff and then sent back and then they have to have it in a certain amount of time before we can get out an agenda. They do take at least almost six weeks. So it would Mr. be an Chair. indefinite continuance. Mr. Chair, I'm not suggesting that a structures report be prepared in two weeks time, but at least give the uh, the, the people that have signed this petition the opportunity to bring somebody before the commission to explain why they think there's more information out there uh, and then we can more fully consider okay. mr chair oh, Ms. Plummer. Uh, yeah uh thank you um i would say that the agenda for um july 22nd is already full at this time so we would not be able to accommodate it on that agenda the soonest would be I believe it's August 5th is the following. Um, and yeah, I would just echo Nicole's comments that um, whether it's a historic structures report or additional information, it's something staff would have to review and make sure it meets the qualifications necessary uh, prior to bringing it to the commission. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Edmonds and then Commissioner Vena. Commissioner Vena, is there any, oh, you're, you're showing up as sideways on um, my screen. I'm not sure if you're aside with everyone else. No, I don't know I'm if right that's- side, I'm, I'm right side up. Yeah, I, um, okay. Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioner Vena, I see you as right side up, but I think it just depends on oh. where your iPad is. So it could just be a fluke for, um, for okay. your- Okay, must be the news. I'm sorry. The background, the background is slanted as I can see, but I'm still- Oh yeah, okay. Well, so it, so it must be just the way the way the new and improved um, uh, software. People working. need people need glasses when they turn about forty or so. <laughs> All right, I'm, uh, I'm going to get my double pair on. Um, okay, Commissioner Edmonds. Uh, well, darn, uh, Commissioner House uh, sort of stole my thunder. I should have fought for that position in line. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I have to um, agree. I, I do believe we have to. You know, pay attention to um, the the community and and their thinking. Um, this morning, in preparation for the meeting, I I drove um, by several of the properties, and so I drove by the press room, and I you know parked on the street and got out. Um, and this is I realize 
uh, a comment that I'm going to make that is not part of um, the 11 points of being a landmark. But there are lots of places that one would maybe go and need direction. And they would, direction would be given by, you know, you go to the really big boulder and you turn left and then you cross the stream and then at the, at the tall tree, you know, you turn right. And so for Santa Barbara, when I'm giving directions or somebody is going to give me directions, I would say it's across the street from the press room or it's down the street from the press room or it's the Lion property right next to the press room and Lion is now it's in a ceramic or, you know, I, I would use that in my vernacular uh, to give someone direction. And I didn't realize that until I was actually there this morning that it's an icon in a way. I've never been there, but I know people that go and I've worked down the street for 30 years, but at any rate, I'll just ramble if I keep going on that point, but it is an icon in my opinion. And I do think we should give the community an opportunity to, um, no more say. Thank you. Sorry, Commissioner Vena. Well, once again, I concur with Steve. And uh, at the same time, you know, it's, it's good to hear the community. I mean, so many times we listen and we listen hard and we try to come in favor of communities and consider them. And this particular case, I think it merits much more consideration. However, if it does create a problem for the for the uh, owner and so forth, uh, that might be something else. But if at the present time, I think time is in our favor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Vena. Commissioner Uli. Um, seeing that we're running behind on our calendar, uh, I'll move that we continue this matter for two weeks. Although That's I think. That. That, uh, it's, it, I think it's the next two weeks is full, as Ms. Ms. Blummer. So is that an indefinite yep. continuance or is it four weeks? I'll give it four weeks. Second. Okay. All right. Motion uh, by Uli, second by House, uh, Ms. Hernandez. I, we need to clarify, do you expect, I think, a full structures report coming back? Because we can't yeah. accept something without that being at that standard. I don't know what you want us to tell the owner to get one. Um, I it would, what I'd be looking for is somebody with credentials. They may not be on your list, but if they could prevent, uh, pr present credentials for you, say, okay, you have the proper credentials. Uh, and, you know, so. That doesn't meet our ordinance. They need to apply to be on the list. We add them to the list and they write a full structures report. And that's the process. That is it. So um, they can get a structures let, report. Let, uh, hold, let me ask a question here. Can, can, uh, can it be that we ask? for any additional information be sent to you and that whether whether or not you at least be presented to the both the commission and you and then you can integrate into the report if you feel like it it um it convinces you of that argument um but either way we get the information and this is the report that we review which is already written but it could be modified to if there's new information or if there's other argumentation that you you think is um worthy of being integrated Yes, Is that, would that work as a solution? Yes. yes. And I think the, um, the member of the public that has, is working with a historian, if they could, we could set up a meeting so we could talk and I know who the historian is. And so we, we know what they, so we, we get all that taken care okay. of in the and background I, because and I otherwise we're not meeting sense. the ordinance. Yeah. And I think it makes sense um, when we relate it to other ways in which we, we've reviewed historic structures reports. Where if there's information from the or argumentation from the public even um, that that convinces us as the historic landmarks commission that there is a certain reasoning that's not being followed, we can reject or accept the report based on outside argumentation as well, as well as the, the historian themselves who's writing the report. In this case, with you, um, uh, could be swayed by one uh, bit of knowledge or the other as well. But that way, we can also be be um, confident that we're reviewing a. Uh, as full as we currently can get right now in terms of everyone's information and everyone had a chance to, to provide yeah. their facts. Yeah, so okay. I will, um, hopefully the member of the public who has the historian is watching and can contact me um, as quickly as possible so we can start working towards that. Does that Mr. make sense as a general uh, or agreeable, uh, Commissioner Uli and Commissioner House? 
Yeah, so Mr. Chair, uh, my expectation is that we're, we're not embarking on a historic structures report. I know how much effort that is. My expectation is that a uh, member of the public speaking um, in favor of um, uh, more information about, about this project um, has that information and we should uh, give them time to submit it to us so that we can review it. Uh, if it's, you know, if it's, you know, written by an unqualified person, then we can say, okay, it's, it's not, it doesn't meet the standard of, uh, of information and we can carry on with our action. But if it is uh, submitted by a qualified person and it raises questions with information we don't have in front of us now uh, in determining uh, the historic value of this property, then it is incumbent upon us to gather that information and evaluate it. Um, and, and once it's submitted and staff has a chance to check it out, uh, if it changes the opinion of what we think about this particular property, then it is incumbent upon us to evaluate that information. Okay. Mr. Chair, Mr. I just want to be clear that we're still talking about a continuation to a, a later meeting. Yes. Yeah. And because and I'm that just is, concerned yeah. about uh, acting on this agenda item and then at a later date uh, modifying it, which might put the city in an awkward position um, that the developer might challenge that, uh, excuse me, you already told us that this was a done deal, it's not historic. And so I'd, I'd hate to act on this and then open it up later. So I think it continues. This, this is about this is about pushing, pushing the, the report, gathering, getting more information, getting it filtered as well through Nicole, but also to us um, by the, the noted um, or by, by any noted um, historian that wants to um, produce additional information for this. Sounds um, good. All right. Uh, and then so that's the motion is the first is uh, Commissioner Uli. Are you okay with that as, yes. the, as the motion? And then Commissioner, uh, Commissioner House is the seconder. Aye, uh, sir. Okay. Under discussion, Commissioner Lundvik. Yeah. I, I think it's important that uh, the motion include the um, implied request that any uh, additional information provided by someone meet the criteria provided for in municipal, in municipal code section 2222040. I would agree. Okay, and the seconder the motion. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, any other discussion? Okay. Um, roll call vote, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Heidi Rydello. Begin the roll call vote. Vice Chair House. Aye. Commissioner Mahan. Yes. Commissioner Edmonds. Aye. Commissioner Uli. Aye. Commissioner Drury. Aye. Commissioner Lenvik. Aye. Commissioner Vena. Aye. Aye. Chair Grumbine. Aye. Thank you so much. All right. Motion carries unanimously. All right. So we are done with this item. We are now going to be on to item four, but why don't we take a little um, a, a five minute break, or maybe actually we should do a 10 minute um, and then we can hopefully uh, charge onward. Um, yeah, let's do it. Let's do a 10 minute break.
I'm good on. I'd also like to Historic landmark commission, July 8th, 2020. All right, and we are on to item number four, uh, 601 and 1425 Los Pasitos Road, archaeology report. Um, this is uh, the, Ro the Royal Borough Open Space Phase Two Restoration Project located in the city of Santa Barbara. This is in the Royal Borough uh, Open Space Park. Project includes restoration of the ephemeral tributary drainage on the western portion of the site, improvements to existing informal trail routes to provide better access and park experience, an 85-foot long pedestrian bridge along Royal Burrow Creek at the north end of the park property and relocation of existing water main crossing the proposed bridge. This is requesting for acceptance of a phase one archaeology, archaeological resources investigation prepared by David Stone, Wood Group Environmental and Infrastructure Solutions. Ms. Plummer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to announce uh, for the commission uh, that the report was reviewed by Dr. Glassow and he agreed with the recommendations and conclusions outlined in the report. Um, and in addition, Erin Markey um, is the applicant for the project and she is available. However, uh, Mr. Stone, the report preparer um, is not. So just so you're aware. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so the applicant want to come on and all right thank you hi. Ms. Markey hi, hi I'm Markey I'm a restoration planner in the city's creeks division here as the applicant um so you read through the brief project description um but the real reason we're here today is to have the phase one assessment accepted um by the commission so um David Stone of One Environmental prepared the report. Um, it satisfies the requirements of the city's master environmental assessment. Um, the investigation included background research and as well as field investigations. There's been a number of previous reports um, done out at this site. Um, the summary is no cultural resources were found or recorded or previously recorded at the site um, and that the report concluded that based on the absence of prehistoric or historic era cultural resources, that the potential um, for significant resources on site, or no, no potential, um, no potential for significant um, resources on site. Great, thank you. All right, so with that, let's go uh, let's open public comment. Any member of the public wishing to comment on the archaeology report? Please follow the instructions and raise your hand. Uh, thank you, Chair Grumbine. Uh, yes, if you could please raise your hand using the hand icon and I'll call on you. We have a few minutes to speak. 
And I do not see anyone who wishes to speak on this item. Uh, or Ms. Plummer, did you receive any written correspondence? Uh, thank you, Ms. Kokinda. And no, no written correspondence was submitted for this item. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, so with that, I'll close public comment. Back to the commission for questions about the archaeology report. All right. Well, if there are no questions. We'll go to comments and and or a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make yes, a motion sure to have. accept the report as submitted. I'll second that. All right. All right. Motion by House, second by Drury. Um, under discussion, any discussion? All right. With that, uh, we'll do a roll call and vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> this is Heidi Rydell. I'll begin the roll call vote. Commissioner Mahan? Yes. Commissioner Edmonds? Yes. Commissioner Uli? Yes. Commissioner Drury? Yes. Commissioner Lenvik? Yes. Commissioner Vena? And Commissioner Vena, you just need to unmute yourself using the microphone icon. Yes. Vice Chair House. Aye. Chair Grumbine. Aye. That is unanimous. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Let's go on from there to um, item five. 206 East Victoria, a project design approval and final approval. Uh, the Victorian style building constructed in 1888, the Bernasconi residence and barn are to designated a structure of merit. Proposal to, for improvements to uh, Bernasconi residence include, including replacement of the unpermitted stucco siding with wood siding, um, replacement of vinyl sliders with double hung wood windows to match the original windows, and a change of use from office occupancy to residential use. Project includes a revised parking configuration to provide a total of six vehicle parking spaces and four bicycle parking spaces to serve the neighborhood market, and a retention of two uncovered parking spaces at at uh, serve the residential unit. Additional site improvements involve constructing a new trash enclosure, permitting existing AC units, and new site landscaping. Project will address violations. Um, and project includes a request for a landscape wa waiver for the Presidio parking lot and a waiver to allow one of the existing air conditioning units to be located within five feet of the front lot line. Project design approval and final approval are requested. Project requires consistency with the project compatibility criteria, staff hearing officer uh, resolution 001-20 and structure of merit findings. Project includes a re request for a landscape waiver for the Presidio parking lot and a waiver to allow one of the existing AC units to be located within five feet of the front line. The uh, project was last reviewed on June 26, 2019. Okay. So, welcome. Um, why don't you uh, take your name for the record and give us your presentation? Oh, do I have, sorry, this, staff yeah, comments? Mr. Mr. Chair, thank you. I just want to make some very brief staff comments before the applicant proceeds with her presentation. Um, this project is before you today for project design approval and final approval. Um, since your last review on it, uh, it did go to the staff hearing officer um, and was approved. Um, so we do have that resolution available if you need to look at it. There weren't any conditions um, specific to the acceptance um, by the staff hearing officer, uh, but is there if you need to review it. Um, also, as in indicated in the footer, this project does um, include two waivers, um, one for the parking lot landscaping, as well as for one of the AC units that's located within five feet of the front lot line. Um, for both of those, I do have the findings available. Um, and essentially what it what you're looking what we're looking for um, is that if you are to grant a waiver that there it is to achieve a superior aesthetic um, or to um, other site constraints. So bear that in mind when you're evaluating the project. Thank you. All right, thank you. And actually that's a good point. We should um, start with the um, 
uh, the comments from our last uh, motion as well. Um, yes, please. So, okay. All right. So the motion was continued indefinitely um, to the staff hearing officer and return to the full commission with the following comments. The commission is appreciative of the restoration of the residents. Uh, the, the number two, the commission is in favor of the open yard modification because of its location downtown, close proximity to amenities, including Alameda Park and the courthouse, and finds it aesthetically appropriate. Number three, the commission is concerned about the uh, geometrics of the parking lot entrance and would like additional study for a better solution, but recognizes the applicant has been working with transportation on a solution. Uh, four, the commission uh, questions the bike rack location and suggests moving it next to the building and incorporating a landscape solution. Five, the commission suggests adding a planter as a parking stop along the south edge of the parking stalls. Six, the commission is generally supportive of a landscape waiver. And the mo motion was by House, second by Mahan. 602, Nemec and Vena abstained. Uli was absent. The motion carried. All right. So with that, why, now why don't you continue with or begin your presentation? And I'm sorry, Brooke, oh, you just need to unmute you. yourself. Thank you. There we go. Sorry about that. I'm Brooke Van Dyne on behalf of Sherry and Associates Architects. And um, so like Pilar said, we are um, appearing and we're requesting project design approval as well as final approval. We had taken this project over from the previous architect who last before last appeared uh, before HLC. And so we have filled in the blanks where they left off. Um, as you can see in the plans, the site plan, which is the second page of the plan set that you have, we address the issues of the air conditioners, the parking barrier with the landscaping as requested. For the conversion of the res or the existing office into a residential unit, you know, only minor changes are being made there. Um, as it's mentioned, the as built stucco is being replaced with siding to match the existing to keep the design aesthetic of the house. And with the project design for the site plan and the coverings for the AC units were designed, keeping in mind the aesthetic of the property and both for residential and commercial use as well. And the open yard, we do we did get uh, approval on that. And so taking this uh, HLC comments into consideration with the plans, we feel that we've, met the requested requirements and would like to get final and design approval. And that's all I have. Um, and can you uh, also just walk us through the, the set as well? Just so be. I'm sorry, what was that? I didn't hear you. Oh, can you walk us through the, the set as well, the, P, the PDF of all, all the pages, just so that we... Sure. Um, yeah. So on... The second page, what you have there is the existing and proposed site plan. You can see the open yard area that was approved. You can see the parking um, where you're turning in off of, oops, sorry about that. My screen jumped ahead. From Santa Barbara Street into the parking lot um, behind the market and how it goes through and passes out onto East Victoria Street. And at that entrance on the Santa Barbara Street side is where you'll see the, the screening for the air conditioning unit that's within the five feet of the lot line, as well as the new <clears throat> proposed trash enclosure. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then on page three is the existing lower level floor plan of the office. Page four is the existing upper level floor plan for the office. And then we move into the proposed four plans to make it a residential unit. 
changing the offices into bedrooms. Uh, the kitchen was largely left intact as a break room for employees. So there aren't really <clears throat> many changes being made to the restrooms or to the kitchen. There is a new bathtub that is being installed on the lower level of the residential unit. Page seven is the existing and proposed floor plans for the barn. We're not making any changes. We're not proposing any changes to the barn unit. And then <clears throat> page eight, you have the proposed trash enclosure. We have a plan view as well as elevations to show what we have planned there. On page nine, we have the existing east and north elevations of the residence. You can see the north elevation at the bottom of your screen. Those are the windows that are being altered to match the rest of the windows on the house. And then if you look at page 10, this shows on the east elevation, the area where they had added stucco. That is where we are replacing that as built stucco with new wood siding to match the rest of the house. And then at the bottom of your screen, the proposed north elevation is to show you what the altered windows will look like and how it goes more with the design aesthetic with the rest of the house. Okay. Keeping that continuity. All right. Does that, does that complete your presentation now? That completes my presentation. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, okay, great. Now we'll go to public comment. Um, and then, yeah, is anyone wishing to raise uh, to uh, uh, comment, please raise your hand. Virtually. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if anyone wishes to speak on this particular item, please raise your hand using the hand icon and I'll call on you. And I do not see anyone who's raised their hand. Uh, Ms. Palmer, did we receive any written uh, correspondence? Thank you, uh, Ms. Gokinda. And no, we did not receive any written correspondence on this item. All right, great. Okay, in that case, back to the commission for questions. Any questions from the commission? Ms. Mr. Chair? Yes, Commissioner Drury. Yes, I, I, I'm I, looking at this these plans on my phone, so I must have missed the um, bike racks. Could, you, is, could yeah. you, that be pointed out to us or to me? Sure, so let me zoom in as well. Those are the see, cars. I'll go across there. There's the air conditioners. Are they are they on the same side as the air conditioners by that curb, curved? Yes, curb? Uh, you're correct. It's the oh, reference okay. number nineteen. Okay. Okay. And is there any plan to landscape any of that area? We haven't specified specific plants to go into that landscaped area just to be a grassy area. We're not proposing any shrubs or anything like that. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Commissioner Lundbeck? Yes, thank you. Uh, you do call out landscaping in that area. Uh, Is that a question? I, I, well, I, I'm I'm trying to understand. It's item is number fifty. Is it number sixteen or fifteen? Sixteen. I'm looking. The, I'm looking. My yes. It's, you're correct. It's number fifteen. Okay. And so you landscape planter with a typical six inch curb, but we have not proposed any particular type of shrub or right. so, you have, shrub. so you have not you have not provided a landscape plan yet. No. Okay. Uh, second <laughs> question, you in I believe you indicated you had enclosures for the air conditioning equipment. Was that did I hear that correctly? 
the screening for the air conditioning unit, that's going to be item number five and 24, and that is on the Santa Barbara Street side. And it's just screening for that first air conditioning unit that is within the five feet of the property line um, for the HLC request. Oh, from <clears throat> but you don't, you haven't provided, you haven't shown us anything. I mean, I don't see any screening there. Correct? That's a question. We can, we can provide an elevation of the screening. Um, if you like, we, we don't have that here on this site plan. Where? And uh, oh. let, me, let me just add to that question, Commissioner Landvik. Um, so what is the screen, the, what is the fence material that's being shown in plan? Just as a... <laughs> It's just a, a a wood border. Is that, uh, is that called out anywhere? Just it looks like a different. Um, uh, look, I think it looks a little different than the, than the um, trash enclosure call out. I'm just trying to under, just want to understand as much as the information as you have right now with it. Or twenty four is that? Does it call out a material or no? Um, 24 is an existing shed to be removed and 23 is. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. And, and I apologize. We don't have an elevation of the air conditioning screening. And if, if we need to come back and provide that we can, it is just a, a low wooden fence around around the air conditioning unit. Yeah, Mr. Lindvik, back to you. Thank you. That was requested and it and we, and we don't see it here. Uh, the the other question I have on the on the plan in the lower left hand area there, I see 16 I believe it's 16 yeah. was your ground cover. So I see 16, which is ground cover. So there is landscaping there of some kind. Correct. And aside and, from just it being a low ground cover, we haven't proposed a specific species okay. of but plant to it, use. Is, do I, do I, it's a question now. Is, do I see a conflict between your handicap accessibility and the landscaping right there? I mean, you know that that the the low ground cover within that is that you and, and it might be difficult to see unless you zoom in on it that low uh, that planter area there is a six inch curb that ends before the handicapped parking space begins so it's not affecting <clears throat> the accessible parking space no i my 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 question is the conflict up at Santa Barbara Street in that area where you show the tri visual triangle, vision triangle, you, you have 16 there, which I guess is landscaping, and then you've got accessibility running through it. So you've got to kind of clean that up right there. Yeah. Okay. Now, the other thing, a waiver, did I hear staff say that we have granted a waiver? Uh, no, Commissioner Lenvik, it's that a waiver is required. So the commission would need to find that a waiver is appropriate. So, and, and what is the waiver for? Question. So, Mr. Bolton, if you could go to the, not to that, the, um, there is a specific code section for go, the go, parking go lot. I, know, I, I think I know what, go back to the site plan. Go back to the site plan. Okay. Please, staff. I assume that the waiver is for the lack of landscaping along the existing building, which is not part of this work, the existing liquor store. On the, I would call it the east side of the liquor store where the driveway is exiting out to Victoria Street, that that, that area between the driveway and the building needs to be landscaped if it's not it requires a waiver is that correct 
So to Commissioner Lenvik, um, the reason for the landscape waiver is that part of this project was to um, change the how the parking lot actually functions. And as part of that, they are required to go up to the parking lot standards in our in our municipal code. If they're not able to meet all of those sections, then a landscape waiver um, would be required. Um, one of those one of those is yes, um, as you indicated, but it's the the trigger for it was because they're changing the parking lot. Yeah. So it appears to me, and this is the question for the applicant, that you have landscaping on the south property line where those one, two, three, four, five cars are, or whatever, six cars, you have landscaping there. Is that correct? That is correct. That is where you're seeing that low ground cover. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, that would not necessarily be a waiver <clears throat> there, although it may be a dimensional waiver, but I think the waiver is probably between the driveway and the building, uh, existing building remaining. I think that's where I see the waiver. Um, I could be wrong on that, and I'd like somebody to clarify that for me, if, if at all possible. Mm -hmm. Those are my questions. All right. I'll take, I'll take my magnifying that. glass and go home. <laughs> Mr. Vena, any questions? Uh, yes. My question is, am I understanding you correctly in that you're not going to be submitting a landscape plan or you're going to be submitting it at a later time or which, which is it? Um, we can submit a landscape plan if you want us to designate a specific species of low ground cover. We were using that as just general terminology, but we can prepare one if, if the HLC commission requests it. I, for one, would like to see some kind of a landscape plan and some softening of the trash area through vines and so forth. I think the low shrub is, the low ground cover is just not going to make it as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Okay. All right, any other questions? Mr. Chair? I'm wondering also if there is an opportunity for uh, vines on the south fence in that narrow planting strip. Uh, you mean the where the cars are? Yeah. Because okay. once again, low ground cover isn't going to go very far. So I'm wondering if there is an existing fence there that uh, vines could be trained on. So that's that's the question. Mm -hmm. to the applicant. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that there's no fencing uh, on that property line. You can see just where the parking ends and the rear yard area of the residential unit. There is a fence that goes around the backyard area, but there's not a continuation of the fence in front of the parking spaces. Okay. All right, Commissioner Uli, question? Oh, you're Commissioner muted. You're still muted. Well, that helps. I can just talk to myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, was it any good? Well, I can always answer my own questions. Yeah. Other than my, you know. Anyway, uh, thanks. Um, I'm. I'm wondering if the disabled spot really is dimensionally correct. It doesn't it doesn't appear to be so can you uh tell me it's hard to scale off of a screen uh can you tell me if that space is van accessible or not the reason why i ask that is that if it isn't um that uh, will modify that parking plan um somewhat or significantly and it's not what we're seeing today um I don't have the dimensions here on that site plan um, and we can show the dimensions on there to show that it is, um, that it does meet the accessible parking requirements. It's just not shown on the site plan. 
Okay. All right, uh, Commissioner Landick, question? Thank you. Uh, a question on that south property line. What is, what is the occupancy or use of the adjoining buildings on that, on that uh, to you? In other words, are the cars nosing in with headlights onto a residential building? Give me just one moment and I will pull that up for you. I'm sorry, I'm just switching between screens here. I didn't see a photograph in that area, so I guess I didn't download it. And then uh, to the applicant, we do have photos available um, if we want to pull those up at any time. It appears that um, there's their commercial buildings on the other side of that parking. You go, you see other, other photos, staff? Other photos? Uh, so it's, it's, okay. it's, it's across the street. That one. Oh, that's that, did it be that building, which is, no, it's across from the no. city parking lot or the county parking lot. Pardon me. Yeah, yeah you want to head down, down Santa Barbara Street. On the Santa Barbara Street side, uh, the commercial buildings that are on the other side of that proposed parking, the address there is 1234 and it's a law office. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, I'm looking at it on Google Street View and I'm seeing there is a large dense hedge already along the property line. So yeah. I would certainly like to know that that's going to remain and that would uh, block any headlights or anything like that. Okay. That's what I'm looking at too as well. Okay. Yeah, and I see that. All right, so Commissioner House already has his hedge grown up. <laughs> All right. Um, any other questions before we go into comments? All right, so with that, let's go switch into comment mode. Um, Mr. Chair. Right. And in and in the just sorry, just one more thing in the um in the interest of of hurrying things along because we're behind, um, if we can keep our comments succinct, add to whatever is needs to be added to, and just agree if, if others have already said what you were thinking, and then we can get going on a motion. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Drury. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the um, part where the house is being, the Berlus Berlusconi residence, I think we were pretty uh, enthusiastic about that whole idea. I remain yep. enthusiastic. I do think that there needs to be at least, uh, besides the the purported hedge that Mr. Howes discovered, I think it we need a bit of a an inventory because that's a rather bleak parking lot, and I think it could use a little bit of a um, little bit of shrubbery, some actually a, a real plant. And uh, I would I would defer to Commissioner Vena about what kind of plant, but I think that that's uh, that's one of the things that certainly needs to be addressed. Otherwise, I think it's a uh, it's a good project. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Vena. Well, my comment is that I think they need to submit a landscape plan by a qualified individual. It's not up to me to suggest what to plan. So, given, I think that is imperative, and screening and vines and whatever else is necessary. A professional should be able to ascertain that. Uh, in addition to to what I'm seeing here, the large tree that's existing, I'd like to see some of the pavement removed around it, and re and reconstruct the fence or redirect the fencing if possible. I mean, it's it's paved right up to the right up to the trunk there, unless the fence is already existing. Thank you. That's my comment. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Commissioner House? Ditto those comments. I think that um, the landscaping really needs a lot of help and is important because looking at the street view currently against the building are just a series of pots with some uh, sad looking plants in them. So it's an improvement to put a curb and actual dirt to plant in, but if it's just low ground cover and there aren't any parking spaces there where it's a consideration of the bumpers overhanging the curb, you know, I think there needs to be something that softens the view of the building. And uh, likewise, as I think was mentioned by Commissioner Drury, uh, something to soften uh, the view of the trash enclosure. And I'm thinking, you know, the little wood fence supposedly that's proposed around the air conditioning unit, I think that's just going to get pretty trashed looking in that vulnerable position. And perhaps that ought to be stucco to match the trash, trash enclosure and the building, keep a consistency. Otherwise, you know, the project's almost there. The big missing part is the uh, landscape plan and an elevation of that uh, air conditioning enclosure. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? Okay, so um, in summary, um, and actually let's, uh, we should also, well, we had, a, we have our comments from previously about the, the commission being generally supportive of a landscape waiver. And I think that we're gonna, um, uh, based on the comments, add a number of those, um, give direction for working towards that. Um, uh, Let's see, I'm just looking to make sure we've addressed the other. Um, I would also add to the comment of the bike rack. We we're gonna want to have it an elevation of the bike rack as well, um, as I didn't see that. Uh, and that could work with the elevation of the um, of the condenser enclosure. Um, and then, um, and then we also already weighed in favor of the open yard modification and um, the geometries of the parking lot, um, I think uh, have been addressed uh, to uh, as a change from previously, um, I guess with the only uh, additional current concern of the, um, to see the accessibility dimensions shown um, how that uh, is gonna meet the accessibility requirements. Um, and then, okay, so, um, all right, so I'll attempt to summarize here uh, the comments. So Commissioner Lenvik, did you have additional? Well, I would make a, I would be prepared to make a motion if, if that's appropriate. Okay. Yeah, do you want me to give you the comments we have so far? Well, let, let me fracture a, a motion here and, and then we can add to it. Okay. My, I'm proposing to give them, uh, preliminary approval, project design approval with final to be uh, taken to consent with the following items to be, to be addressed. Uh, number one, I'm not prepared to grant a waiver. Go back to the site plan staff, if I could. As I see it, the waiver The only waiver would be the landscaping, lack of landscaping along the existing building. And if the entry drive with is shown accurately, then the exit drive would not need to be any wider. And therefore you could landscape between the drive and the existing building. So if that's the only waiver that we were asking for, or they're asking for, then I'm not prepared to grant a waiver but I am prepared to give them project design approval with final at the consent calendar with the following provisions. There'd be a, a professionally prepared landscape and irrigation plan, which includes some vertical elements at the existing building and includes planting on the face of the trash enclosure wall uh, facing Santa Barbara Street. 
that there be details showing the enclosure concealment of the mechanical equipment, preferably plaster face enclosures to match the adjoining building. Uh, next item, that the bike racks be clearly shown and described. And if there is a paved area that they sit on, the bike sit on, that that be shown um, and its relationship to landscaping be shown. And what else did you have, Mr. Chair, that should be added to that motion? Um, there was que a question about the, I think it's existing tree and existing fence, as I believe. Um, okay. But but um, if it was proposed fence, Commissioner Vena has said um, to, to move it away from the trunk of the tree and give it some space. So, um, so, so the landscape architect then should show how he is protecting and enhancing uh, the um, livability of that large tree that's at the end of the parking area. And it may require some permeable paving at its um, in that area. Anything else, Mr. Chair? Um, uh, and that we were, if, if this is a motion, and then also that we were um, enthusiastic in support of, of, um, of the, um, of the restoration work on the um, on the historic residence. Uh, so my the final item, uh, Madam Secretary, would be that uh, a color information be provided on the proposed windows, on the trash enclosure walls and gates, and the bike racks and I believe that's all that we would have. Mr. Chair, um, well, actually, there was one more actually item was the dimensions uh, to meet ADA parking that needed to be shown. Um, that's that, exactly what I was going to say. Okay. And, and actually the other um, item was when you brought up Mr. Lenvik was uh, the extension, the showing the full extension of the, um, accessibility route, accessible route to the sidewalk or to the public right away. Show that, and I would ask also ask the applicant uh, an additional item on this motion is they show the show the existing adjoining property landscaping, which we believe to be a hedge on the south property line uh, abutting the parking. Okay. All right, Mr. Um, Chair, and then to Commissioner Lenvik, um, as part of project design approval, there are a number of findings that need to be made, um, as well as the waivers. So if you if you're not able to make the waivers at this point in time or make all the findings, um, you will need you will need to continue it. Um, you can continue it to consent for project design approval and final approval, or you can uh, schedule it to a later full commission meeting. Um, but we do need that was one of the one of the findings they have to make is that it complies um, with the city charter and the applicable findings. So, and uh, just as a point of clarity for that, um, we don't do we know all, um, all the reasons for the acceptance? Commissioner Lendig brought up the one on the. Um, on the side of the exit, but it, does that, are we sure that that was it? That, that was the only thing asked for, for the waiver? No, that's it? correct. There's there's the parking lot waiver, um, which Mr. Lundvik has indicated his reasons for, and then the mechanical equipment, which is within five feet of the front lot line. So the exceptions for those are that it is um, warranted to provide relief for existing site constraints or to achieve a superior aesthetic that is discretionary to this board. If you think that those waivers can be made at this point in time, or if you need additional information prior to granting product design approval, um, but that would need to be incorporated into a motion for product design approval. Thank you. 
I will, Mr. Lennox, I will make that uh, mechanical waiver uh, exception because I believe the single existing compressor, come on, single existing compressor, um, it's at a public street far from residential or whatever and uh, the other equipment has been placed farther back. So I'm able to make that waiver that, um, for existing site constraints, although that's not really true because they could move the darn thing. Um, but I, I may, I, I would, I would, Test the waters and making the waiver. Um, because what I ask also that um, in in looking at the site plan, if we can go back to the site, that site plan real fast, um, perhaps as part of that uh, the um, instruction to the landscape professional as well is to um, it seems like there's a plenty of space in where the where the other con the open condensers are to ha and of of landscape possibility that they could also screen it. Um, screen those uh, other two condensers with, um, you know, low hedge or other some other landscape um, elements so that you don't see it walking by um, uh, as well. So would you add that to your um, landscape, uh, um, what's it called, direction? <coughs> the, the ones labeled- I'm gonna, I'm gonna back off the waiver for that equipment. That equipment can be moved back Five feet without a problem. I mean, he's he's got to he's got to do uh, you know. I think he can move that equipment back five feet, and we don't need a waiver. So I'm not about to give a waiver for that single piece of equipment. No. Okay. So, Mr. Chair, if we're not able to make all the applicable findings and a waiver, I would suggest a continuance for the applicant to. Um, resolve the commission's concerns and then apply for a later date for project design approval. And final approval. I would modify my motion to be a continuance to a later date with all those provisions noted. Okay, Commissioner Vanna. One last thing. Uh, did we get any kind of a late lighting plan or is this, or how are they lighting, illuminating at standards or otherwise or what? That's my question. Thank you. Um, as as from as far as I can see, we don't. Um, we can actually. Uh, it, this is a question. If we can uh, get the applicant to um, uh, respond. Um, all of the lighting um, is existing. We're not proposing any changes to the exterior lighting in that parking lot. So a lighting plan wasn't provided just because there's no changes. Okay. Um, and can I answer a question that was previously brought up? Sure. Um, on the, the large tree that you're seeing on the site plan and how the fence and the paving yes. go right up to that tree. I just wanted to point out that that is existing. Um, and that's not something that's new and proposed. That's something that is already there. And so, to be clear, the, the only proposed portion of that then is the um, is the fence, uh, or sorry, the gate um, going through? Is that what that we're seeing? Correct. Okay. All right. So that that actually makes it simpler. Uh, Commissioner Vena had said if it was uh, existing, then then that's a different uh, scenario. So and tell us otherwise if you don't if you don't think so, Commissioner Vena. Okay. Um, all right. Was there any other questions? Because we had jumped back into the question. Yes, um, Chair. Yeah, Commissioner House. I hate to be difficult, but uh, in looking at this street view, I see there are three wall packs, which are kind of a light fixture mounted high on the wall, which point out from the building. So they're not shielded and they are quite glary, as well as conduit applied to the surface of the building. So I think it should be researched whether or not that lighting was installed with permits. And if not, uh, lighting that's compliant with the lighting design guidelines and lighting ordinance should be um, specified on the plans. Okay. Uh, all right. 
we'll, we'll go, okay, we'll go back into, um, do you know, is there any, do we have any information on that um, applicant for, um, on the lighting or no? Okay. We, we don't have any history about the existing lights and if they were okay. installed with or without permits. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so now we'll, we'll go, let's go back into comments and we're actually, actually back into the motion. Um, uh, and so with that, those revisions, oh, uh, Commissioner Lenvik, do you, uh, would you, would you accept the additions of the comment of the lighting, uh, from Commissioner House? Yes. Okay. The lighting, uh, we'll second the motion. Okay. Commissioner House has seconded it. Um, under discussion, any discussion? All right, let's do a roll call and vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Heidi Rydell. I will begin the roll call vote. Commissioner Edmonds? Yes. Commissioner Uli? Let me find my button. Yes. Commissioner Drury? Commissioner, Commissioner Drury, you're still muted. Oh, yes. Commissioner Lenvik? Yes. Commissioner Vena? Yes. Vice Chair House? Aye. Commissioner Mayhem? Yes. Chair Grumbine? Aye. That is unanimous. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. So we are on to item six. 215 East Victoria Street. This is a continued item for concept review. Um, and it, this is a revised project description. The 12,900 square foot lot is currently developed with three unit building fronting Victoria Street um, and two store and a two story, two two story buildings towards the rear of the lot. Proposal to demolish the existing 1,000 square foot garage, uh, the existing two story building, three bedroom unit, existing two story building, two bedroom unit, and 45 square foot shed in order to construct a new two-story apartment building. The three existing units in the front building are proposed to remain. The seven unit project will be developed under the average unit size density incentive program. The residential unit mix will include five one bedroom units, four two bedroom units, and one accessory dwelling unit with an average unit size of 1,100 square feet. Minor site improvements are proposed, including demolition and replacement of the stairs to the second level and replacing the existing entry deck unit C of existing triplex. The existing driveway and parking areas will remain. The new paving and new landscaping throughout the site. Staff hearing officer review is required for an open yard modification. This is for concept review. No final appealable decision will be made at this hearing. The project was last reviewed on May 29th, 2019. All right, Ms. Plummer, you have something to add? Thank you, Chair Grumbine. Um, before the applicant's presentation, I just wanted to reiterate um, that this project uh, is under a revised description. Um, it still is presented under the AUD program, um, but they have made some design changes since it was last reviewed. Um, one thing that is still remaining is staff hearing officer reviewed is required for an open yard modification, um, specifically for unit C. Um, and that's at the front building that's proposed to remain. Um, so just bear in mind while you're reviewing um, the project scope today, um, the aesthetic appropriateness of the open yard condition um, as those comments will be referred to the staff hearing officer for her review. Thank you. All right. Mr. Chair. Oh, hold on one second. Uh, Ms. Kimkita. Uh, so, Chair Grumbine, so just to let you know that applicant Ellen Bildston is also on the call, but she does not have webcam capabilities. Uh, thank gotcha. you. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, then um, lastly, Mr. Chair, before um, the applicant's presentation, uh, if the commission does want to see the prior elevation um, site plan rendering, things like that, I do believe we have those available. Um, you know, but the design has changed from that. So they're just there if you need to look at them for reference. Okay, uh, sounds good. Why don't we do a quick flip through at least get everyone's uh, so that we remember what it was um, and then we can go into the new, to the new proposal. Mr. Chair. 
Yes, Commissioner Drury. Um, could, could you read the comments from the last meeting, please? Yes, absolutely. Sorry. I, yep. I will pull them up. You can keep going through here. I'll pull them up separately. I should have them here. All right. Okay. You got them there. Okay. Um, okay, so the last comments were continuing definitely to the full commission for project design approval with the following comments. The commission thanks the applicant for their additional study and work. The project is moving in the right direction. In general, the commission encourages the applicant to seek a modification from the staff hearing officer for a reduction in open space with a roof above to preserve the existing balcony configuration of the front building. The back building looks too sparse. In general, the commission would like to see the back building softened with elements such as awnings, landscaping, and lights. Enhance the paving materials, especially at pedestrian walk areas and around the entries. Use landscaping to break up the long east side. The commission likes the coloring of the windows and would like to see a color sample. Uh, look at uh, favorable locations for a trash enclosure. In general, the commission would like to see another solution to the overhang over the garage of the second building. The horizontal railings are not appropriate in El Pueblo Viejo. The, it was motion by House, second by Drury, 600, Mahan, Uli, and Nemec were absent. The motion carried. All right. So, but this is an, also a new design. And so, with that, um, I'll let the applicant um, take over. Please uh, introduce yourselves for the record. Uh, Commissioner Uli, did you have a, a question before? Uh, just a quick point. I meant to say it on the last item as well. There are two channels I've been binge watching lately, Netflix and Channel 18. Um, and so I've uh, seen all of the hearings of, of this matter in the previous one. All right. I'm glad you have such good taste in binge watching. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ken Vermillion with Buildston Architecture and Planning. Oh, sorry. We could just pause you for one second. Uh, Commissioner Mahan, did you have something you wanted to Yes, yeah, so I've also I've also watched the uh, the hearing that I missed earlier. Okay, great, thank you. All right, sorry, uh, and you may continue, applicant. Good afternoon, um, everyone. I'm Ken Vermillion with Buildston Architecture and Planning, and on the call as well as Ellen Buildston. And part of my interruption, could you just uh, project your voice a little bit more? Uh, the audio for you is a little bit quiet, or if you have headphones, that might work better. Thank you. Yeah, I've got I've got a phone, so I'm going to put it more in front of my. That's that's much better. Thank you. Okay, great. So good afternoon, everyone. Let's just go through the the drawing set initially, and then we should have a supplemental um, PDF that will uh, continue on through. So first page outlines the, the data for the project. We're really essentially talking about nine units with uh, an ADU added to that. Per AUD um, density for this project, we would be allowed to do 10 units um, along with an ADU, of course. And so the square footages are there. We're well below the average 1125 square foot per unit. Um, you'll see some of the units are quite small one bedrooms in the neighborhood of 515 square feet. Page two, um, looking at the existing building, uh, and that's the building right in front. We're essentially uh, proposing uh, no major changes to that building, and we know in past meetings the uh, board was recognizing the existing front balcony. And we'll get to that page in the set, but we would like to agree with that assessment. Um, and that's why we need a slight modification for a couple of private open yards for the existing front building. So again, existing front building with three units, two on the ground level, one on the upper level. And you can see the context. Obviously the previous project is in there across the street. Um, going to page three, these are more uh, property photos uh, throughout the um, existing parcel. You can start to see down the driveway, uh, the existing single story garage um, and the single car uh, storage uh, building there. 
And then there were two back units that were originally going to be kept and maintained as apartments, but this new uh, project will uh, demo all of the existing structures behind the first building and replace them with two new two-story buildings. Um, so page four, existing survey. So again, all structures behind the front building, the two-story house on the left would be removed. Existing driveway access utilized. And page five, so this basically the top Section is the demo plan describing or showing what I've already described. And the bottom two plans are the existing front buildings. And this is, we left this here because this was the proposed reworking of the front stair that would allow the upper unit to get a proper sized uh, private outdoor living space and also allow the lower unit to the bottom half of the plan realize a 10 by 10 minimum square foot outdoor space as required by AUD. So that's what you had seen before. And the comments were that um, perhaps there's a way to maintain the existing. Um, we, uh, in retrospect, agree with that. And so you'll see in the new plans, we've simply taken the existing stair and changed the bottom run from going to the driveway to going to the middle of the property. But again, no changes to the downstairs units, no changes to the upstairs units is proposed here for the existing front building. So page six, we've got the new proposed roof plan and site plan. On the site plan in the very front yard, you'll see that the lower run of stairs for the front building now uh, flips 180 degrees and would be accessible from the front walk up. That's a stair, of course. So the new uh, accessible path is to the far top of the site there at the front along the sidewalk, and that would ramp slowly all the way throughout the site. You can see uh, adjacent to the front building, uh, the two private yard spaces called out. The one uh, on top, yeah, there you go. The one on top opposite where the stair is for the front building is meeting code. The one to the bottom for the other one bedroom unit is not meeting code simply by not meeting the 10 foot width requirement we can more than accommodate the actual number of square feet. We would just need a modification to allow for a, a skinnier rectangle to achieve that square footage. The other bit of that stair is that the existing balcony, exit balcony for the upper unit is not deep enough to uh, qualify for an actual AUD uh, private outdoor living space for that unit. So we would also, of course, ask that that be allowed to be modified and exist as it does now with no changes. And then if, as you go through the uh, pedestrian walkway at the top of the page, at the top of this drawing, you'll see you come to a break between the existing building one and the new building two. That would be our 15 by 15 required common open yard space. You would have a stair off to the left, that would take you up to the upper story. That building two would be one, one bedroom unit on the ground level. It would provide cover, carport cover for four parking spaces. And then there would be two units on the upper level. As you proceed on, you would come to the entry for that unit. You can see the recess, provide some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, porch space for the unit. And then as you continue on toward the back building, you would pass by a fenced in private outdoor living space for that ground floor unit. And then you would come similarly to the back building. Um, the back building would have a stair up to the upper unit units. And uh, again, as if you keep going along that path, you'd get to a recessed porch area for the entry into that one bedroom unit, which is almost the same 
play out as the front building. And then at the end of that path is the private outdoor yard, fenced in yard space for that ground floor unit. And then immediately to the back of that is the private outdoor living space for the rear unit. The rear unit is the only unique unit in building three. It's a two story owner manager unit. And that would be accessed on the bottom of the drawing right there exactly. So that would be the entry with a fenced in yard for the back unit. Underneath uh, the cover of building three, you see five covered carport parking spaces, and then the ADA access aisle uh, in between the two buildings. Just for clarification, the ADU does not require a space. Um, so technically we could require, we could park only nine cars if we wish to, but we're opting to provide 10 spaces in the ADA aisle. We go up to the roof plan. Top of the page. Um, solar is going to be a big aspect of this project and the front gable roofs um, exist and will remain. Uh, the rear buildings will be flat roofed with small parapets and you can see some of the breakups uh, for the various balcony spaces. Um, each upper level unit is two bedroom um, uh, and you see those large decks for those. Those qualify for the out private outdoor living space. There's a small one right there that was being circled prior on the front building that would um, be for the right for the a the ADU, which doesn't require outdoor space. So that's just a nice little pocket balcony uh, wouldn't meet the size requirements. And then you can see the balcony uh, at the edge of the stair for the back building. That would be the balcony that would satisfy the one bedroom unit right there in the back building. Um, if we go to the page seven, take you through the unit plans. So you can see on uh, building one, which is new building one, I apologize, that should technically say building two, and the other building should technically say building three. But of the two new buildings, these are how the floor plans would work out. As you see in both of the lower levels, we've got sizable trash mechanical laundry spaces set aside so that we don't have uh, trash cans out in the yard. Um, you can see the entry porches for the units in red, see the private outdoor yards. And the upper levels um, in both of the buildings are two units. Coming up the stair, you've got a common landing and then you proceed on to the green unit, which would be the two bedroom with the large outdoor deck. And then you'd have the one bedroom back uh, 180 degrees, degrees back from there. Unit H is the unique one. The one in orange is the two story owner manager unit. And that would have bedrooms and bathrooms on the ground level and living and kitchen dining space on the upper level with its own private deck. Uh, going through to page eight, take a, look, take a look at the elevations. The old building had a similar roof height as the front building. The front building is uh, basically 23 feet above its grade position with the gables. Our new buildings are 21 and a half feet tall from their relative ground levels. Now the front building is roughly two feet lower than the middle building and the back rear building is two feet higher than that. So while the site does step up gradually with the uh, parapet heights and the roof heights kept low, they will be almost um, not seen from the front street elevation. And what we'll do is we'll go through um, some of the design intent. Um, the flat roof idea is um, largely based on the work of Irving Gill. Um, Time-wise, time uh, era-wise, uh, his work was going on from early 1900s through 1930s. Um, really clean interpretation of, he started with Spanish, Spanish colonial, um, and really there are a few concepts that he felt were very important, um, and we'll get to those on the next page, but just wanted to go through 
some of the thoughts and design cues that we brought from the front building are the wraparound corner windows. Um, we've maintained that, um, and albeit a slight interpretation from that uh, with not as many breakups in the glazing panels themselves. And then these uh, built out window boxes. Uh, so to provide sun protection on various uh, elevations um, and to promote the look of this uh, kind of like Irving Gill popped um, window box. We've come up with a system to do that. And you can see some of those with the sloped edges. Um, and again, simple massing, but carved away in, in, in methods that would change the appearance of the buildings from different spots on the property. Um, that was another big uh, design uh, idea of uh, Irving Gill. Um, and you can see on the uh, walk access way, uh, the sloped uh, stuccoed wall for the stairs for each of the buildings. You see the carports with the cars tucked in underneath. Um, then if we go to the last page on this drawing set, you can see some of the ends of the buildings. Again, these are elevations that really are um, not seen um, in total at, or at all based on uh, the layout of the buildings. Um, but again, the same kind of uh, simple form making um, carved away masses uh, to get a uh, lots of shadow play and some three to three dimensionality to um, each flat elevation. So just to look through a little bit of Irving Gill's work, that's the far right, the photos, uh, top the very famous apartment complex in Santa Monica, California. Um, these, you can see the pops of the massings. You can see the wrapping ribbon windows. Um, you can see the popped out window box uh, ideas. Um, and, you know, basically the things uh, that I haven't maybe mentioned are he was big about landscaping and letting the landscape be um, the uh, foremost um, uh, aesthetic appeal uh, and, and let the architecture take a back seat to that. That's why he didn't do a lot of cornices, um, a lot of fancy railings um, and uh, uh, um, column capitals or, uh, or other details like that. And then if we go to the other document, it's just a little three page document there. So we've got a cardboard massing model um, and I can hold that up if anyone wants to see more of those images. But here's what we've got basically. Uh, the concept behind the forms of the roof is the two uh, photos on the left is the building immediately to the west of this property. In fact, that's our driveway. Uh, alongside of this building. And what we're what we see over and over again in this type of architecture and all around town is this front kind of sloped roof piece attached to a back much more simple parapet flat roof style massing. Um, you could even see in the lower photograph the front windows of the neighboring structure have uh, breakups in the windows yet the ones that face away from the street are much more simple and less um, detailed. The building on the corner, the upper right photo, that's the convenience store at Santa Barbara Street in Victoria. Again, same thing. Even though you can see this building from the long side, there's a small portion that's got the, the, the tile roof and then the rest is a flat parapet roof. As you go down Santa Barbara Street, um, of course, against traffic, you would come to the, um, the restaurant building there at Santa Barbara Street and Equestrian. Same concept, the slope roof in the front and the flat in the back. And that's really what we're trying to set up here with our project. We've got an existing gable roof for the existing residents, no intent to change that. We want to let that be the front piece that's visible from the street. And we want to let our two buildings be simple flat roof for many reasons, one of which is that we like the style of that and the simplicity. But again, it's going to be covered in solar panels 
and we want uh, condensing units and everything to be placed up there. We need mechanical space uh, to make that happen, and we feel like that's a much more efficient use rather than putting more equipment on grade level. And if you just go to the next page, there are some other projects around town, other buildings around town. Um, Alameda Court, as you may or may not know, uh, in that ring of buildings, several of those buildings are flat roof with parapets. Some are a mixture of gables with some portions raised parapet. Um, the University Club at the corner of Santa Barbara Street and Sola Street. Obviously, the front main building on the corner has the gable roofs with the tile, and then the back portion of the building visible from the parking lot, as you can see, is a, is a combination of the flat roof that works well. Um, and then the other projects around town, little bungalows on Santa Barbara Street and Victoria Street, three of those in a row. Um, that's where we're getting at with that. So go to the last page, just a simple bit of model photos just to take a look at the massing and the overall um, site. Again, very low scale, low two-story buildings, all shorter than the front building um, and uh, very invisible from the street face. And so that's what we're thinking with the concept of, of breaking from the front building to the rear buildings. And with that, I think we're ready to hear okay. comments, questions. All right. Okay, so let's go to um, public comment then. So any member of the public wishing to speak on this um, matter, please raise your hand virtually for the instructions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, like you said, if you wish to speak, please raise your hand using the hand icon on your GoToWebinar control panel and I'll call on you. I do not see anyone who wishes to speak at this time. Ms. Plummer, are there any written comments that uh, we received? Uh, thank you, Ms. Kokinda. No, we didn't receive any written correspondence for this item. Okay. All right, in that case, back to the commission for questions. Any questions? Ms. 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 Edmonds. Oh. oh. Oops. We'll go Commissioner Edmonds and then we'll go Commissioner Drury. All right. Um, I'm, I'm trying to form this into a question. Um, I, <laughs> okay. I, I visited the property this morning um, and I visited the last time it was on our agenda. And um, I guess what I'm struggling with is it's almost directly across the street from the prior item that we had. Um, and as much as I like the um, modern look and the idea of solar, et cetera, um, the sleek lines. I'm not sure that I feel like it fits into the neighborhood. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could put up um, the slide that shows um, the, the front without the modeling that you just showed. Um, so we could look at that again. Actually, so that seems to be it. Yeah, that's a side view. I'm wondering if we could have a front view. No. If the applicant um, has a particular page number that we should go to, uh, please let Timmy know. Hi, sorry, you're talking about the existing building. If I'm standing across the street and I'm looking at the existing building, do you yeah. have a page a slide? two? Page two, okay. So the lowest photo there in the middle, the big front facade is the existing building, which would not no, change. I'm sorry. I, I, I saw that this morning in person. Um, so I, I know what that looks like. Can I see what your drawings look like of that? How you propose for that to look from that view? In that we, we would only uh, cosmetically affect the exterior with paint or something. We're, we're okay, proposing so it's going to essentially stay the same as it looks right now. Correct. And the, and the roofing material would be? It's composition shingle right now, which right. is, yeah. And you would leave it that? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. And just as an additional question to that, because we have it up here. So the stairs aren't changing at all or the stairs are changing? 
the only part of the stairs that would change would be the part that you don't see. So the lower run that's going that way toward okay. the drive would just change it and make it come Good. to the walk. Kick the other way towards the center. Correct. That's it. Okay, great. Just want to make sure that we're in, while we're on this. Okay. Um, Commissioner Edmonds, is that uh, Commissioner Edmonds, is that all the questions that you asked? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Drury, you had a question? Yes. Uh, so am I to understand that the the uh, second unit is two feet higher than this front unit? And then the third unit is two feet higher than that. Is that correct or did I hear it wrong? Correct. It's roughly two feet floor to finish floor to finish floor from the front to each next building. So as you go back the full length of the site, uh, 150 some odd feet, you're up four feet by the time you get back there for the back building, okay. but that's so great. I don't, I don't suspect that's going to actually, it'll probably bring them all in line visually if you're standing on the driveway. It seems to me you have a really nice kind of a phalanx of buildings going back up the driveway. Well, that's a comment. Okay. I, that's all for me. Thank you. And just, just to be clear, Commissioner Drury, I wasn't sure if you were asking this question or not. You were talking about the the height of the ground, the, like the finished floor where you walk onto, or the overall height of the building? The overall heights of the buildings. Okay, can okay. you go to elevation for that and just clarify that? Um, Sorry, right. So the front building, because of the gables, it go, is 23 feet tall. Our buildings are lower because we have flat roofs. So we make up for that two feet of climb by our, our parapets are 21 and a half feet. So we drop. 18 inches from the overall height of the peak of the roof of the front building, yet we're going up almost two feet to get into those units. So it's a wash almost. Oh, okay, so so the, the, those two proposed uh, back buildings are really only higher just because of the elevation that you're going up the driveway. Correct. If they were all on flat ground and all the same finished floors, they would be lower than the front building. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, okay, good. I wanted to make sure that was clear. All right, Commissioner Mahan. Yes, uh, do you have a, a, a front view of the of the building to the west? That's an Edwards and Pittman building, the office building. Do you have a front view of the whole, the stairs, including the stairs? Um, uh, I, we don't, I don't think we included that. The one, the building to the left with the white. Well, it's, it's partially on page two. Yeah, but it's not, it, yeah. Right, there you go. So you don't have a front. Can you zoom in there, Jimmy? You don't have a the, photograph of the front of that building? Uh, not all the way across it. I mean, the, uh, the, the, step, the step area here that's, that's right in here, the steps. We have that, that on the stone below, but we don't go to the doorway. If you look just, if you scroll no. down just a little bit. There you go. The the uh, pro the project before us, the last project we looked at, had a very good uh, photograph of it. I wondered if if you you showed us a lot of buildings around Santa Barbara, around the El Pueblo Viejo. Um, are any of those buildings shown in our guidelines? In your guidelines for historical properties, or yeah, we, there's a lot of in our guidelines, we have a lot of examples of buildings that we think are appropriate for El Pueblo Viejo. I wondered if if any of the buildings that you showed us are in our guidelines. I well, my guess is that Alameda Court would be, but I'm not positive. And we do have it, that it, on two of the second. It, it, are you familiar with our guidelines? Pretty familiar with our guidelines? Sure, yes. Is Irving Gill in our guidelines? Irving Gill is not in your guidelines. I don't have any more questions right now. Okay. Um, so I'll I'll add, and, and I wanted to get one thing in terms of clarity, and then I uh, had a question as well. Unless, unless there's other questions, uh, or uh, I guess we can just keep going with other questions. Um, so uh, this is a question to staff, just for clarity. We are review we're reviewing this project for um, uh, com well 
for because there's a historic structure on the property uh, as a historic resource um, and then as uh, and but it's not an EPV is that correct I just want to make sure that we're clear on everything I, I know I think I know what Commissioner Mahan knows it's not but no I Mr. Be, Chair be there's no designated building on the property it's an EPV so that is the only reason oh, okay. um, that it's being Sorry, reviewed I, is because it's, it's within been, the it's EPV. been a while and I thought it was okay gotcha okay all right. Um, so uh, uh, the uh, question I had was, and if we can go to the Irving Gill examples um, and inspirations. Um, okay. So um, let's see. Okay. Yeah. If you can zoom in. Uh, well, let's start with the top image. Let's, if we can zoom into the top right. And then, okay, so looking at this inspiration image and looking at the, the drawings that you have um, uh, and looking at the, some of the others as well, um, it looks like there's a corner condition um, that Gil likes to um, go glass and similar in similar way to what um, you have with the existing building, uh, especially in that lower bay window that's popping out and has that little shade device. Um, there's that condition. And then in general, I'll start with a comment and then roll it into a question. Um, in general, uh, Gill tends to uh, less, not have a, a strip window all the way across, but really have super simple massings. And then in some corners, he go, he eliminates it to a, a glass um, corner. In this case, is, it seems to be pretty long on the strip window version um, across the top. It seems even long more abnormal than um, most of the uh, Gill examples that I've seen. Um, so, and I, and I noticed that you did, it seems like that's the, the direction of your incorporating into the massing for these, uh, for your back buildings. And what, for one, the question is what, why not? And then if you can scroll down a little more, um, what, what was the thoughts behind not going towards a more the Irving Gill of this, where you have massing stronger on the corners and also more wall um, and less of a strip opening effect um, than uh, than the the sort of the upper example, which was the the only one that I've seen that has such a strong. It's almost like a uh, well, uh, some of it is sort of Le Corbusian um, and it's um, Bill Savoy um, kind of uh, effect or or reverse um, with having this the strip up up top and not not a uh, removed bottom on Peloti. But um, it, I, so I wanted to get some of your thought on the, on that design um, of, of not going with the, as much of mass uh, for some of your gill examples. So, yeah. So, you, I mean, basically the ribbon window versus just a corner aperture. Um, mm -hmm. I, yeah. I skip thing. And yes, the ribbon windows are great. Um, and without being, you know, a hundred percent literal, um, we wanted to utilize that as a concept of, um, you know, opening a corner with windows is a lot different than having a window on either one wall or the other. Um, and so when you're stuck in a long parcel like this, long and skinny with a little room, sometimes you want to make the spaces feel bigger and get a look out more than just one perspective view, right? Either uh, due south or due uh, west. So that's what a corner window does for you. The other thing is we wanted to pick up on the front building and its its ability to do that too. I mean, clearly that was one of the things almost on every corner of that front building, there's a series of wraparound windows. And so we felt like incorporating that was reinforced by Gill's um, thinking and then by the building itself that was on site. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lundick. Yes, I, I need some, some help from the commissioner staff. We're in EPV. And as I understand it, there are three or four or five accepted design standards that uh, are available to us in EPV. You know, you have Mission Revival, you got, you know, Monterey, Monterey Revival, you got Spanish Colonial Revival, you got California Adobe. But I don't know that by ordinance or charter that I see any place where Irving Gill is an approved, an acceptable 
design for EPV. And when this project came to us originally with the um, 50s contemporary whatever house in the front with a, with a low sloping roof, the applicant proposed to have the building, the single building in back made similar to that. And we found that we probably could bend the rules to make the, to allow the back building to match the front building. But I don't know that it's in our purview and Pilar will probably correct me on this. I don't know that it's in our purview to take and make the entire project, which is a new project with two new big buildings, something other than the approved standards in the EPV. So I need some help on that first before I go ahead and comment on okay. Irving Gill's architecture. All right, Commissioner Plummer. I'm sorry, Commissioner Plummer, sorry, Commissioner Plummer. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank Commissioner Sorry Lindbergh. for calling you that mean name. Yeah, in, in general, Commissioner Lindvik is correct. There's um, 22.22.104 required architectural styles. So there's subsection A, which specifically outlines what styles of architecture are appropriate to the district. Um, so for any structure hereafter construction or altered shall be within one of those styles. Um, then there's a subsection two alterations within El Pueblo Viejo, notwithstanding paragraph one, alterations to existing structures within APV may also be permitted by the commission in the following circumstance. The commission determines that the owner of the existing structures proposing alterations or additions that match the original architectural style and such alterations or additions do not significantly alter style and the commission determines that the alteration or addition would be more compatible with the existing structure by matching and maintaining the existing architectural style, which demonstrates outstanding attention to architectural design, detail, material, and craftsmanship. That is up to the discretion of the commission to see if you feel that this project meets that section. Um, okay. I, don't, I don't know that I could make the finding that this is an alteration or an addition. These are two new buildings, larger than the remaining building on the site. And I think we ought to be real careful before we move down the road too far with this, with this application and understand that we are not complying with the charter or the, uh, or the ordinance. Is there a question in there? No, it's a statement. Okay, well, let's, let's stick to questions right now. Um, so, uh, all right, any other questions? Mr. Chair, Mr. House, uh, just to confirm what I think I'm looking at on your uh, elevations on sheets eight and nine, I think um, it looks like it's a pretty scant parapet, so it would not be sufficient to conceal solar panels or mechanical equipment. Is that correct? Uh, no, we certainly believe it would conceal solar panels in the middle of the roof. Um, you know, it's whether you could see that from the property um, or however far back, we could make that a uh, reality that whatever parapet is there, we would make that the goal to, to hide the visibility of the parapet. Okay. Of the, oh. That's my only question. Okay. All right, any other questions? from any other Yes, Mr. Questions? Chair. Commissioner it Gray. Be, yes, it might be instructive to see what's on the what would it be the east side of the in the neighborhood the east side going back along i don't know if the property next door is that deep the, the first property to the east but it would be instructive to see what they would be looking at if they look to the west to the new development proposed development um that's that's i guess is that a question or a comment i, I that sounded I can, pretty commented <laughs> yes. Yeah, so Unless you wanted to say, be, would it be instructive? <laughs> yeah, because I I know that we we've had a, a sometimes a problem with with solar panels, which we support, of course, um, but we don't want them um, visible to neighbors. If they're single story homes, then that's not a problem. But if they're if they're two story homes, then that might be a problem. So we would need to be assured that the solar panels, as presented, would uh, would be hidden from the neighborhood. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm muddying so the, the water. So the question is, 
So the question is, will will those be visible? And it might be that you can show us with that in other ways um, later. Or do these drawings actually show that right now? Right. And and I would just say that if these were gable roofs, you would see those solar panels. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions? All right. Let's roll into comments. Now, into a comment phase. Commissioner Drury. Yeah. Um, well, what I what I wrestle with is that the first the the building on the streetscape, the elevation on Victoria, is a very interesting and attractive building. And I, I think that you moving the stairs so that they debouche into the middle of the of the of the uh, walkway is, is a good idea. It doesn't go so it doesn't shunt people onto the driveway, especially since you have more cars coming out than you've had before. And I think the elevations are attractive. Um, I, I like that style of architecture. The problem is, is that do they fit into the EPV guidelines? And that's something I I would think that the other commissioners might be better equipped to deal with but i think there's something it, it's like just um two points two points shy of being acceptable and i think that requires some some judicious architectural embellishments to bring it more in line with with the el pueblo viejo guidelines those are my comments okay. so far thank you all right commissioner man yeah, the the um, I mean, there's no question that the uh, that the designs that you're proposing are very beautiful. Uh, I I think the Barcelona Pavilion is one of the most beautiful buildings that's ever been designed, but it's not a it's not and and Irving Guild's architecture is really not appropriate to El Pueblo Viejo. Um, our our architectural fathers. Uh, uh, Edwards and Plunkett and and uh, and these these architects that designed in the 20s they knew what Irving Gill was doing down in, in San Diego they probably even liked it but they didn't think it was appropriate for Santa Barbara Santa Barbara was to be a Spanish city and we have the three uh, acceptable styles that we have to work within in El Pueblo Viejo and and uh, these this design as beautiful as it is is not appropriate to uh, to the historic district and and uh, commissioner Lenvik, i think said it we we i think we bent over backwards last time to let the buildings behind be similar to the building in front which existed but but this is a bridge too far now that you're putting out in front of us and and i could not support it thank you all right commissioner uli I don't have any comments at the moment. All right, Commissioner House. Oh, that's uh, that's right. You're just turning your camera on because everyone was supposed to turn their camera on. Yeah, very good. All right. New Thank you. Are hard yeah, I was going to, I tried <laughs> to jump in there, but yeah, it's just for this question. Okay. Yeah, for everyone can turn their cameras on. You can, but maybe not everyone has a comment. I'm not sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, I also want to know that um, El applicant Ellen Bildston also um, would uh, like to request your attention, um, but that's at your discussion. Okay. Um, well, why, well, why don't we give her give over you open um, into the question section and see if there is anything else additional that she wanted to add to it. And but it have to be very quickly because we are we are falling behind here. So. Right. Um, yeah. I I call it this. Somehow I was muted um, by the by the organizer, so I was unable to speak earlier. Um, I, we we understand um, you're addressing the, the particular styles of the EPV and um, would like to just kind of make a make the observation that there is even in this photograph that we're looking at on the screen this kind of very typical and fairly dramatic transition from the front element of a lot of buildings and the EPV and the rear buildings um, and the rear portions of buildings or separate buildings. There, there's the primary one that faces the street that upholds the EPV um, appearance and then frequently there are simpler structures behind. So just like to kind of emphasize the fact that our view of 
compliance with EPD is more that um, despite the fact that these are new buildings, they're, they're intentionally playing a modest role and in a way wanting to augment the, you know, what's very special about the front building that is a bit mixed in its background and its aesthetic, as we talked about in previous meetings, got some elements of Monterey style, other elements of fairly standard apartment buildings of its time. So there are a couple of, uh, ref you know, historical references to tie into for these very simple buildings as we see them at the rear of the property. Okay, thank you. All right, um, we'll go back to uh, comments now um, by the commission. And since now I don't know whether you want to speak or you're just obeying the rules. There we go. There's a hand. Mr. <laughs> House, <laughs> your rate rose real hand, not just a virtual hand. Oh, but you're muted, so it's not working. Turn on your microphone. Okay. I don't have a hand icon, so I had to use the real thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so I love Irving Gill. And you know, I could see an argument for an Irving Gill building, but what I'm seeing is not Irving Gill. The point was made that the buildings were background to the landscape, and I don't see much landscape in, uh, in the site plan uh, to make that um, similarity. Um, and with the carports tucked underneath and various other things, it's it's Irving Gill with a modernist flair, a contemporary flair. And the inspiration drawings or photos that we saw have a lot more traditional detailing that has more in common with the front house. So, you know, there's an argument to be made for the flat roof buildings. I don't know that I call them Irving Gill anymore, but you know, they, they need to have more of a relationship to the front house. This has been a consistent theme on this application that it's constantly an effort to depart from the architecture of the front house, which you know could um, be argued for, even though that's not entirely consistent with uh, 2222104. You know, if there there have been instances where the HLC has required. Uh, the new construction to be Hispanic uh, and not match the existing just because it's consistent with the ordinance. You know, there's uh, in other cases an argument that, well, this is the existing architecture of this front house. And so it doesn't make sense to depart from that. But to go to something yet different that has very contemporary detailing on it, um, you know, it's just stretching from here to there and it's just too far afield from what I could possibly approve. Um, so I think if the applicant wants to get closer to an approval, they need to get serious about something that's consistent with what's required by the uh, municipal code. Um, and I think also it really needs to be taken into consideration that solar panels and mechanical equipment need to be hidden. Um, I did look at street view and yes, it seems like it would be hard to see it, but um, unfortunately the fact of the matter sometimes is the solar panels get mounted on a, a structure that boosts them up higher than the roof. So, you know, the point was made that if there were solar panels on the, on the front house, on the comp shingles, they'd be uh, very visible. Yes, they would be, but they're not supported by a stick framework, a steel framework. So that's kind of the difference that if they're silhouetted against the sky, that's more of a problem. So I think that's all I have to say. All right. Um, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Edmonds, I like this. This it has the old school feel instead of the virtual hand. All right. Commissioner Edmonds. I, you know, I thought I had a comment and then after listening to Commissioner Howes, I actually have a bit of a question if that's all right. Um, yeah, sure. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling with um, the fact that, you know, I, I like the, the, 
the sample or the, uh, the examples that were shown. Um, and I and I like modern buildings. But what I'm struggling with is the front house not fitting into our EPB guidelines. And um, so my question, I guess, would be if um, if the owner is coming to HLC for um, a remodel, for example, or, um, would we not, or is there not language that might require them to, um, you know, get in line with our guidelines or is, is that not there? I, I think that what was read out was that if, if, if it's a remodel or addition, it could stick with the language of the, the current, the, the existing house is. So if it's a 50s house or a 60s or 70s or whatever, um, it could stick with that language as we could find that it could stick with that language. But this, these are the Commissioner Ed Lendick was making up, was pointing out that these are totally separate structures. And even though we were stretching it before to get it to work with that, the current house, now it's even more, you know, now, now he was saying that, I don't know, uh, you can jump in if I'm saying it wrong, Commissioner Lendick, but for time's sake, um, he was saying that, um, that, it, that now it's sort of gone too far abroad. Um, and it so in my, be. in my view, this is a development of a piece of property. You know, you're actually t taking structures down and you're rebuilding structures. And um, it, it just seems to me again, I, and I, I guess I would agree that uh, th there's just too much of a difference and it would be difficult for me to support it as well. Okay, Commissioner uh, Lembick. Yes, I, oh, I believe yeah. Commissioner Edmund, oh, I'm muted now, I'm fine. Right? Uh, yeah. I think Commissioner Edmonds' question was, if they were remodeling the front building, would it be required of them to make it comply with the EPB standards? And the answer to that question is yes. If they were remodeling the front building, the ordinance is very clear. New buildings or remodels or additions have to comply. But they're not touching the front building, and so that's fine. But, and, and even, as, as I said before, when they were only putting one new building on the property and leaving all the rest in back, we were able to find a way to bend the rules for them on that and have them match the front building. But when they're taking and doubling or tripling the size of the property development with new building, then it's got to be, I believe, more, more consistent with the EPB standards. And, um, you know, we've got to make findings for neighborhood compatibility and Right now, uh, the neighborhood probably doesn't have much to be compatible with. But I think that when they come back to us in plan and in elevation, they need to show what's happening on the adjoining parcels. We cannot review a project in isolation. I mean, the project is going to affect the neighbors all the way back on the property on both sides and in the rear. And we need to see what those other properties look like and what their height is and scale is, so on and so forth. If you have only one story buildings all the way back and you're putting a two story building, you know, large all the way back, how is that different than a four story building abutting a two story building? And we struggle with neighborhood compatibility. I don't see we have a neighborhood compatibility problem here, but I believe the applicant has got to make his application drawing wise complete so that we see what's happening on the neighborhood. But as others have said, I cannot support this style of architecture in EPV. Okay. Um, any other comments, Commissioner mm -hmm. Uli? I went the wrong, I went the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, I love it. Uh, but that being said, um, you know, if you took the um, the gable roof off the front building and put a put a flat parapet on it, it's it's very gillish, in my opinion. Um, uh, overall, I like it. I'm okay with um, with two story structures. I'm okay with the two buildings. I'm okay with uh, with the overall site design. I think it I think it's appropriate. I don't think we have a compatibility issue per se um, with the massing of these buildings. Um, I do have a problem with the fact uh, that nowhere in our guidelines does it talk about the language of these buildings uh, being allowed. 
Uh, and so I think that is a huge problem. Um, you know, I wouldn't require them uh, to bring the front existing building into the standards since that building existed before we had the standards. Uh, but um, uh, the new buildings uh, need to be more appropriately uh, languaged uh, to meet the standards of EPB. Mr. Chair. Okay, Commissioner Howe. Just a couple added thoughts. Having served 16 years between HLC and ABR prior to this term, a couple important principles I learned. One was incrementalism that when a new uh, improvement is added to a property in EPV, even if the front the existing building isn't a model of what we would expect or would currently approve an EPV, what's added should be an increment of improvement. So we should always be looking to head in the direction of compliance. Uh, second is when justifying your design, don't look for the worst examples in the neighborhood, look for the best. And I'm not saying that there's worst examples they're comparing themselves to, but I think it's a way too big a stretch to find buildings such as the University Club that have a beautiful front facade and they have a little appendage at the back that has a flat roof. Um, it probably might not be allowed that way if it came before HLC today. But the fact is, this is far more than just a little appendage at the back of a building. Uh, this is two new large buildings with flat roofs uh, that just don't relate to the front building at all. All right. Okay. All right. So I'm uh, I'm gonna give some of my own comments, and then and if anyone else wants to throw the last ones in, and then we, we can make a motion. Um, so similarly, I, I had similar feelings. Um, uh, the one the one difference I would say is um, when I look at the Irving Gill examples that are given, I could see. I can see a crossover um, in work that uh, that you could um, that Irving Gill had that was on the more traditional side um, uh, that is sort of crosses into the Mediterranean realm, um, of, but it's a very simple version of it. And I think that that also ties to some of the examples of buildings that you gave that were the back of buildings and the and the rear or the less important ones and the and ones like the um, uh, like the University Club. But even then, that parapet wall had a little detail. It gave a little Spanish hint. Um, it still had, even though it had been simplified to almost the minimalist, it still had a little flair of Spanish. But actually, the biggest part that um, uh, is not so much the details, because I think that things might be able to be simplified down and still be in the Spanish language, but um, in the massing itself and the, the, the geometry of uh, long, large, long openings um, that's horizontal is really um, it's it's not really um, a part of the the um, CPV any of the any of the traditional um, architecture and that's because gravity goes down and in general the mass um, there's more mass on buildings or especially on corners um, or at least in within rhythm um, that aren't about a long horizontal opening and that's very much a different language and a modern language and so. I think the massing actually is the biggest factor um, in my mind of uh, of not being uh, supportable. And even if you had trimmed it out in Spanish, um, uh, you know, Spanish tiles and and add, added Spanish flair to it, it still wouldn't be um, uh, it wouldn't be supportable in my mind because of the the overall massing of the of the pieces. So. Um, Mr. So Mr. Other, Chair, um, may, I, may I make yes. one more comment? Mr. Sure. Chair, actually, before we proceed, we're picking up some background noise. Um, so I would just ask that everyone that is not speaking, please mute yourself. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone because I think um, there's a ghost caller on. So I have to mute everyone, and then I'm going to go through systematically and unmute uh, the commissioners. So bear with me for just one moment. Okay. 
Please see, go ahead. I'm going to um, still unmute people, right. but you can go ahead and uh, continue. And I'm sorry about the interruption. Right. Commissioner Drury, do you have something to add? Oh, you might still be muted. Commissioner Drury, you're now unmuted. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Trying to. So I, I'm looking at the what's on the screen on on the TV. The it's it's weird to me as just as style that the east elevation, which is the lower picture, is more coherent with the front house than the west elevation, which looks completely out of out of scale and uh, looks actually kind of monolithic by comparison to the front house. But the the east east elevation looks much more coherent. So I'll leave that to the architect yeah. to figure out. But anyway, that's all <laughs> I have to say. And I think actually, uh, Commissioner Drury, that was that was one of the main the main point I was trying to make in terms of the massing because I think the massing of lots of plaster on the east elevation that you see versus a big opening uh, where the cars are on the west elevation that reads as an, as opening um, and not as plaster and solid wall coming down to the ground was what I was um, uh, commenting on on the, some of the, the the difference between Gill as um, span on the Spanish side of things or the, on the Mediterranean side of things versus, <laughs> and traditional side of things versus Gil as the, the modernist. Um, I agree. But, okay. So, okay. So then with, so I, it sounds like, let me, let me try to summarize the comments. Um, the main comment o overall arching is that um, the current design as proposed is not, um, not, is not, um, uh, does not belong in, uh, or is not conducive to the EPV guidelines um, and needs to be so um, to continue. Um, and the, un, some additional pieces of concern and um, and study as as we go forward are um, solar the solar panels and um, mechanical equipment on the roof. Um, wanting to make sure the roof the the parapet if there is a parapet used that it's um, uh, studied from different angles and and from the neighbor's side of things as well. So that we can see um, how visible um, that mechanical equipment is. Um, the uh, uh, yeah, views views of all the different um, surrounding parcels, and um, looking at the the design um, going forward in relationship to the the various buildings surrounding this site. Um, and in general, I think that the um, the commissioners were in favor with. Uh, the, the move of just cleaning up the front house and also, or front prop, front building, and also on Victoria Street, and also um, uh, the flipping of the stair. I, it seemed like there was only positive comments for that. So the treatment of the front building was um, was generally speaking acceptable. Um, the uh, height of the two two-story buildings did not. Well, I don't want to go into that because I think that um, some of the comments of um, just compatibility will end up uh, pot potentially changing heights and, and massing of things. So um, I think we can probably leave it at that point, um, unless there's any other additional comments that need to that people want to make. Um, uh, the um, yeah, I, I think we should leave it there before we start commenting on open yard or things like that because the massing might be affected. Um, and unless, unless staff feels otherwise, that we should um, weigh in on any other. Um, element in particular at this point. I'm not hear, hearing anything. So, um, so with that, is there anyone that wants to add to that or make a motion, Commissioner Lundvik? Oh, I think you're muted, Commissioner Lundvik. I'll be glad to make a motion to uh, return this to the applicant. Uh, continue it uh, to a non-specified resubmittal time uh, with the comments that uh, we have offered that it does not meet the standards of EPV uh, and that we want to see additional information regarding the surrounding properties as part of the next submittal. Second. All right, motion by Lendick, second by Uli. Um, under discussion, Commissioner Vena, did you have any discussion to add? Yes, I just have one. <clears throat> excuse me. I just have one example that might fit what we're doing or what's happening here. And that was when I lived at 412 East uh, Figueroa, and it was owned by the Mills at the time. They too had a similar situation. They had a Queen Anne house in the front, 
which was remodeled and so forth. However, the addition in the back had to be of the Hispanic type as we're speaking of, and so it was. So there's a good example there if anyone wants to check it out. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, any other discussion? All right, in that case, we'll do a roll call and vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Heidi Rydell. I will begin the roll call vote. Commissioner Uli? Yes. Commissioner Jury? Yes. Commissioner Lundvik? Yes. Commissioner Vena? Commissioner Vena, we didn't hear you. Yes. Um, yes. I yes. Thank yes. Thank you. Vice Chair House? Aye. Commissioner Mahan? Yes. Commissioner Edmonds? Yes. Chair Grumbine? Aye. That is unanimous. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, so now we are on to uh, item seven. 1300 East Cabrillo Boulevard, new concept review. This is the Santa Barbara Zoo. Um, uh, it's located in El Pueblo Viejo. Proposal to repurpose the former Asian elephant exhibit area into a visitor immersive Australian walkabout exhibit featuring kangaroos, wallabies, and emus. The project includes constructing two small aviaries. Uh, visitors will enter and exit the exhibit via two fence open air vestibules and circulate on new accessible pathways to the exhibit space. The existing barn will remain and receive minor alterations to remove the large elephant shade trellis and create indoor and outdoor holding spaces to serve animal care and management needs. The project includes new landscape and irrigation using reclaimed water to provide additional shade and appropriate habitat for the animals. This is for concept review. No final appealable decision will be made this year. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, Michael, sure. Brewer, I'm Good. going to sign off now because I have to go at six o'clock anyway. Okay. All right. Oh, uh, you don't believe we'll be gone? We'll be done in thirty minutes? No. <laughs> you have no faith. Have Have a good evening. All right. Everybody. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Gray. All right, Commissioner Edmonds. Um, I just wanted to disclose that I'm I'm a past board member of the Santa Barbara Zoo, um, which I ran by um, um, Miss Ostranger this morning, and I don't believe that it would affect my ability to vote on this issue. All right, sounds good. Are you Australian? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ms. Plummer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to let the commission know, um, I do believe Kelly Broadison, the case planner for the project um, is on call. Um, this is the first uh, review for this project at the conceptual level stage. Um, and I did want to note that um, as it's designed right now, it's not requiring a CDP, it's proceeding with the coastal exemption. Um, and if Kelly has any additional information, um, she can jump on and provide that at, later. All right, thank you. Okay. So does the applicant want to proceed? Yes, and um, we have Cameron Carey. Um, if you could turn on your webcam, I've sent you a couple of webcam requests, and um, there's a, a full applicant team here. Um, you know, generally we like to designate a just um, a, a smaller number of people, but um, there's a number of team members who can answer questions if the commission has any. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, well, would you like to introduce yourself and um, you and unmute yourself and proceed? Rich Block, if you're on, would you uh, want to take the helm? I am, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> hey, thank you so much for, uh, thanks, thanks so much for taking uh, the meeting with us today. Uh, we are, it's been a long time since we've been back in front of historic landmarks. The last time was, was for our uh, giraffe management facility. Uh, and before that, it was quite a few years uh, with other projects. So we're, we're happy to be back. My name is Rich Block. I'm the president and CEO of the Santa Barbara Zoo. 
So are we going to go, are we going to introduce everybody real quickly or sure? Jump well, right into it? Hi all, I'm Adam Sharkey with Blackbird Architects. Um, and uh, Cameron, I think we'll want them to load the slides for Rich and Aaron to be able to talk to before we look at the plans. And this is Ellen Kokenda. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Block if you could please turn on your, thank you, you just turned on your webcam. And for anybody not speaking to please mute yourselves so we don't pick up background noise. Just as an introduction, I'm Sam Mapus, the landscape architect for the project. So I'll unmute and Cameron Carey, the owner's representative from Timing Group. Uh, Aaron Marshall, Chief Operating Officer, Santa Barbara Zoo. So, as you might imagine, uh, over the past two years, we we lost both of our uh, major uh, residents, our two elephants, uh, leaving a rather large parcel of the zoo empty, and uh, it certainly was uh, didn't go unnoticed by all of our guests uh, certainly as well as our, our members and, and, and team members uh, one of the the goals uh, was to try to figure out what to do with that space uh, we organized a, a process and started with about 36 different options uh, that we could pursue uh, to fit in that space uh, and the, the the range of uh, species was uh, amazing uh, but what we wanted to try to do was do something reasonable that would be cost effective, create a great new fresh experience for our guests and be something that we could work with the city uh, to move through quickly. So we could, the, the goal was to bring something online by the summer of 2021. Uh, and that would help us move forward and be able to answer the many, many questions from guests about what was going to happen uh, in that space, as well as eliminate so many of the uh, incredible suggestions of a dirt bike, dirt bike path uh, to bringing back dinosaurs, uh, all kinds of suggestions from the public. Uh, so we would like to move forward. The person shepherding this process for us uh, was Aaron Marshall. We wanted him to, to cut his teeth on a, a new capital project. Uh, the scale uh, of, of this project was appropriate and uh, Aaron did a capable job of stepping in and managing that process uh, from the beginning of 30 some species uh, to where we have arrived today with the Australian walkabout. Aaron, over to you. All right, thank you, sir. So, so you know, as Rich said, thanks for having us. We're really excited to be on the agenda today and get a chance to share this project with you. Uh, page two. Please. Thanks. Uh, so this project is pretty, pretty large and it lies right at the center of the zoo. Uh, I think hopefully we're, most of us are familiar with it. Page three. For a number of years, this is the habitat that housed our Asian elephants and it was actually redesigned for them with the help and support of this group back in 2003. Page four. So in that process, we needed to develop some heavy elements for uh, elephant animal welfare. Uh, that included the barn, the bollards, trellis structure, a pool, and a large parasol structure. Page five. So as we look to transform the former elephant habitat, we're pretty excited to remove a lot of these heavier elements. Page six. So as you can see here, the parasol and the heavy bollard structures and a lot of that concrete are going to be removed uh, as we advance this next project. Page seven. Additionally, we would like to remove the heavy trellis, the fencing, and the elephant way station. So uh, as we move away from um, our former Asian elephant exhibit space, uh, we're pretty excited to bring Australia to the zoo. Page eight. We are excited to introduce Santa Barbara community to kangaroos and wallabies and emus. Page nine. We're envisioning an innovative and fully immersive new walkabout habitat. This is a space that moves guests past the mesh so that they're sharing space with these incredible animals. It's a lot like a walkthrough aviary. And slide 10 gives us a habitat that will really enhance our ability to engage guests and use unique experiences to connect our guests to animals and nature. 
which really hits on our mission. Slide 11. By moving guests inside the habitat, we're able to really take our guests to Australia in a sense and, and open up the wonders of these species. Slide 12. And as you can see, this, this new proposal has a very different feel from our former elephant habitat. So kind of to talk about the particulars of the concept, I want to hand things over to two of our project partners, Adam with Blackbird and Sam with Earthworms. Thanks, Aaron. I think we can jump over to the, the PDF of the submitted drawings. Um, if we go to the next sheet, the title sheet just shows, as Aaron has already shown, that it's sort of central in the zoo um, space. <clears throat> From a site plan, the um, lighter gray uh, fill of surrounding pathways is all existing um, that sort of encircles the exhibit and is a, a guest path, visitor pathway that kind of climbs up and around the former elephant exhibit and has a couple viewing decks that are at the bottom of the page that look down over the exhibit. So there's about, I think, a 15 foot elevation change from the visitor experience from the low, the top of the page, basically the low point of the exhibit uh, around to the top. Um, the intent, as Aaron mentioned, is to be an immersive exhibit. In removing the large, heavier elements, it turns it more fully into a landscape experience, which is the goal. Um, so new pathways are proposed that connect to the existing and uh, create an accessible walkway that slowly kind of undulates up and down slightly, but takes you kind of through the space. Um, there's some nodes for more viewing where visitors can pass each other or stop and, and watch kind of the animals in their various spaces. Sam can talk a little bit more about the various spaces we're creating, but at a, at a hardscape level, um, there's paths that come through. There's um, some modifications to the barn, which are, as Aaron mentioned, to, to remove that sort of large trellis structure to add, if we maybe go to um, the next page, you can see just some modifications to rock work. We have, um, this is the two vestibule areas. So the areas of entry and exit from um, into the space and shows the general character of landscape at the vestibules themselves. There'll be some very light um, shade sail elements to provide some shade and transition for guests going basically through two doors, which are needed to kind of create safe passage and and entry and exit from the space. Um, if we go to the next sheet, yep. So there's back of house types of fencing and things that are shown here. I think if we zoom in on F3, um, which is in the top right, this is the sort of typical new enclosure. So as the photos had shown that elephants required really heavy bollards, large um, diameter stainless steel cables. The intent is uh, to create a highly transparent um, enclosure uh, edge that technically works, but is visibly um, kind of goes away. So a two by two woven wire mesh, um, which has uh, been used for other projects your commission has seen, like the California condor exhibit. It's highly transparent. It's just held by cables. Um, and then there are some columns that are every 10 to 12 feet approximately. Um, landscape planting will go around those spaces and, and the, the mesh itself will kind of undulate through to allow landscape to be on both sides of that enclosure. If we zoom out and go to the next page, um, the rock work, there's existing rock work that's on the barn that, that uh, was part of the modifications that were made for the elephants in 2002, 2003. Um, we're adding, we're taking off the trellis and adding some new kind of enclosure rock work elements so that you're not seeing the barn doors and en large entryways into that space and allow it to be more of a landscape feature. If we go to the next, these are some site sections that just show the kind of overall landscape character, the rock work elements on the barn, and these sort of new pathways that are moving through. The large elephant um, pool that was uh, on one side of the exhibit is now going to be turning into a sloping grassy hillside and a much smaller um, water feature. Um, and then if we go to the next, that takes us to really the heart of the exhibit, which is really the landscape experience of, of being in the out of doors and, and engaging. So Sam, Sam can tell us more about the, the planting and, and landscape design. Thank you, Adam. So uh, 
as the, the visitor in the zoo is actually walking on the pathways described on the outside, they're able to look into through this veil or this drape of fencing from locations on the west side and the south side. There's some small arrows that you can see pointing at uh, points of interest that'll view through that fence. As Adam described, there's landscaping on the outside and it flows through kind of that screen fencing to landscaping on the inside to kind of blend the two and make them kind of uh, compatible both in the exhibit and outside the exhibit. It's also to encourage the visitor on the outside to actually see enough, but not all of the exhibit and the trees and mounding inside the exhibit allow for some smaller spaces internally that you might be curious about going in and getting to the queuing areas of vestibules and actually getting inside this, this exhibit. And uh, the intent is to get on these walkways and move uh, through and circulate on the paths. Uh, on the south side, we have existing large olive trees that remain and we're gonna create a sloping rocky slope that the animals, the kangaroos, wallabies can get up on the rocks, they can rest and They'll be viewed at eye level or maybe even above eye level, as well as being able to be viewed from the decks on the south above people outside the exhibit. will be able to look down into the exhibit onto the open lawn areas onto the uh, rocks that are right below them to get a view of the feel of the exhibit and the inside animal activity, which hopefully will encourage them to go inside and be a part of and close to the animals as they're moving around these grassy, more open spaces, all the light colored grass or lawn type area allows for an interconnectivity and circulation throughout the entire project. The water feature on the southwest side and the counter dynamic on the northeast side kind of create little areas where the animals would congregate. They might be in a smaller setting or in groups there where you could observe them feeding, feeding areas grouped with water areas, kind of encourage the animals to be in certain spots for better viewing. The aviaries are on the upper northwest side and you'll be able to get into those via the pathway and get in to see the indigenous birds. The, the plant material, we're, we're looking at the, the darker trees in the middle being taller, higher canopy trees to create some shade and a microclimate cooling for the mounding that's in the middle and also on the upper left. So we're creating some undulations of the actual topography to create interest and movement of the ground plane. The, kind of olive green trees in the center. Those are more medium height trees and they're meant to add interest in color and flower. All of these are Australian trees and shrubs and grasses indigenous to the Australian climate. We're working with the uh, San Diego Safari Park and their extensive experience and the plant list that we're using off to the right as uh, options for us. We were learning from them now and understanding what plants that the kangaroos, wallabies, emus will leave alone or don't torture as much uh, in terms of eating or exploring or testing. So because of that, we're wanting to make sure that the, uh, the exhibit is durable, both horticulturally for the animals to be safe, but to be very interesting and be a big part of a botanical discovery of the Australian environment as well as, well as the animal environment. So we're trying to encourage people to see enough, but not give them everything, almost keep a little curtain. So they have to come into the stage. They have to come into the exhibit and move through the rooms to actually be able to participate. So we're very excited about all the aspects botanically and certainly with the animal culture and to bring this to the Santa Barbara Zoo in a, as a real centerpiece. So thank you for getting us on the, uh, the agenda at this late date so we can keep this project moving. That's it. Great. All right. So does that complete your presentation? I think so. All right. Great. All right. Now we're on to public comment. So any member of the public wishing to comment on this item, please raise your hand virtually, follow the instructions. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, if you'd like to comment on this particular item, please raise your hand using the hand icon and I'll call on you. I do not see anyone who's raised their hand at this time. Uh, Ms. Plummer, did we receive any written correspondence? Thank you, Ms. Kokinda. Um, we didn't receive any written correspondence on this item. All right. So with that, I'll close public comment and back to the commission for questions. Not all at once. Any questions? Mr. Chair? Yes, Commissioner House. Um, on the outdoor holding and support, uh, there's a page that shows the elevations of that. I'm not sure which page that was, but uh, the material doesn't seem to be called out. And that's the only thing I'm uh, curious about. Maybe back one more. Um, yeah. Back another one, or maybe we already passed it. I don't know. Yeah, there you go. Uh, look at um, detail seven. What is that material? Commissioner House, the intent for um, the only fence type that visitors may be able to see aside from the woven wire mesh would be a um, solid stained wood fence, um, which is what this is. So it'd be horizontal. Um, tongue and groove boards, so no gaps, no laddering, and those would be heavily landscaped in front to kind of fade back. Okay, I had no idea whether it was gleaming stainless steel or it was something organic. Thank you. All right, thank you, Commissioner Lundvik. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I have only been on the board for a couple of years. I don't recall that we have seen anything from the zoo before. Uh, I find it interesting that we're reviewing exhibits but that may be a requirement of the uh, coastal zone or whatever um, I certainly have no problem with this uh, I would however however comment that some of the exhibit spaces or at least the holding areas are visible from Cabrillo Boulevard and, and I know you've tried to landscape them out of our view but um, I don't see this as being a problem because it's not anywhere near the edge of the uh, periphery of the zoo. So, uh, but I'm just surprised that we review uh, exhibits. Thank you. Uh, to Commissioner Lenvik, the reason it's on the agenda is because it's in El Pueblo Viejo Landmark District. Um, so that's the only reason it's before us. And, and we even review construction fence. So we... We will review it all. Um, all right. Uh, other questions from commissioners? Okay. Um, okay. So in that case, well, if we have no other questions, let's go into comments. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Uli. Sorry, I saw Commissioner Uli up first. Do okay. you have any comments? Uh, yes, I do. Sorry there, Commissioner House. Uh, I was quick on the button, but slow on the freeze, apparently. Anyway, um, uh, I think we all love the zoo uh, and certainly miss, miss the elephants. They were so entertaining to watch. Um, and I think this uh, is a terrific project. I think we should speed them on their way uh, and get it done. It's all happening at the zoo. Um, Mr. Howe. As opposed to Commissioner Lenvik, uh, in the eight years I was on HLC previous to this term, I did see zoo uh, applications many times. And uh, Mr. Block and I go way back at this point. And the zoo organization and the architects have just been a spectacular team and they do a wonderful job. So I think um, I'm entirely behind this, this application. Great. All right, Commissioner Vena. Oh, I think you're muted. Having the zoo 
grow from nothing to something spectacular. It's now, it's now apparently going to be even super. I've, per, I've perused all of the plant material. It's exciting. The shrubs, the selection thereof, the trees, etc. I think it's going to be a wonderful and exciting facility and not to mention the type of plant material that's going to be expressed. Good job, Sam. All right. Commissioner Edmund. I'm, I'm really on here because I had a notice that I was supposed to, to put myself on there. I don't know if anybody else had it, but <laughs> since I'm here. I know, forgive yeah, me. Exactly. I feel like I don't want to constantly interrupt your meetings, but um, for comments, um, it is nice for all the commissioners to turn on your webcams and, yep. uh, and maybe raise your hand or uh, the chair could just right. go down. The, to the, the Santa Barbara Zoo. Oh. And that makes it easier. With you and Australian type. Oh, we just got on your main oh. room. Oh, Commissioner I think you need to uh, mute your mic. Um, I can All share right. that I have the, had the honor of being on the search committee for Rich Block, and it was um, obviously a, a, an excellent decision that we made. And uh, so now, so now you're making you're taking credit for it. It was really it was really an honor. So we go way back. Um, and I think this is absolutely wonderful. I happen to have an uh, Australian book on Audible going right now, and I was delighted to see the uh, um, Australian exhibit today. So um, I would fully support it. All right, uh, Commissioner Mahan. Uh, I'm ready to make a motion for what What do we want to do here? Move this on to uh, uh, this design review? Okay, so we have this on for this is for concept conceptual review. So no final appealable decision will be made. So okay, I well, guess we would just. I I, th I think that that I agree with everybody. This is a great project, and and as soon as it comes back for us, uh, we'll be able to uh, give it give it a uh, design review. Uh, um, uh, Ms. Plummer, if you want to weigh in on what what could be. Um, potential motion that would be where, where this is going next. And Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the next step would be to continue it indefinitely. Um, like I said earlier, um, it looks like this will qualify for a coastal exemption. Um, so it just needs to go through the application completeness review process and CEQA uh, to make sure um, that it's meeting everything that it needs to. And then it can come back to the commission for project design approval and final approval. Um, would you like this to return to the full commission for review or would it be acceptable to push it to consent? Um, I'll leave that up to the commission. I'll make a motion for uh, indefinite continuance. Second. Okay, motion by Mahan, second by Uli. Um, and would you want to add some comments just so we have them on the record as well of, of uh, yeah. Uh, in terms of, um, how, yeah. Okay. Very excited about the uh, Australian in indigenous uh, creatures that are going to be coming into the zoo. We think it's a, a good uh, uh, replacement for the elephant for the elephants which we've lost, and uh, we're very excited about uh, about the way this has been designed and and. Uh, and the landscaping is Australian. We, we just think it's a, a, a very well thought out project. All right. Great. Thank there. you. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Lendick, what was that? Yeah, I'm, I uh, agree. And I would certainly support sending this to consent when he is ready to go back for project and final. I don't know if and I, have I, have I have sent to consent, consent as well. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I, I think that that, uh, that the indefinite continuance, if that can go to consent, that would be very good. I'd be I'd be very happy to review this on consent. Okay, so the make of the motion and the second are okay with that. Um, any other discussion? All right, we'll do a roll call and vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Heidi Rydell. I will begin the roll call vote. We would have started with Commissioner Drury and. <laughs> <laughs> we As before six o'clock for the record, Commissioner Drury, can you watch this? Yeah. Um, so I'll mark him as absent. Commissioner Lundvik? 
Yes. Commissioner Vena? Yes. Vice Chair House? Aye. Commissioner Mahan? Yes. Commissioner Edmonds? Yes. Commissioner Uli? Yes. Chair Grimmine? Aye. That is All right. Thank you. You know, Commissioner Drury out, absent. All right, so, and this is not an appealable thing. So I guess it would go on to uh, AEQA instead of CEQA because this is an Australian um, environmental <laughs> quality. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so with that, I think we are done. Is that right? All right, so we'll, uh, any other news before we adjourn the meeting? I think we're good. All right, meeting is adjourned. Sayonara.